Pessoal, boa noite. O, o áudio tá bom? Vocês conseguem me ver bem? Tá tudo tranquilo aí? Eu tô, eu, eu tô com a live aberta aqui. Ah, tá. Tá funcionando, ok. Não tinha atualizado ainda. Ok. Bem, boa noite a todos. É, damos oficialmente as boas-vindas ao encerramento do sexto coloque Nejap de estudos japoneses, A Espada e a Pena, Guerra e Cultura Marcial no Japão. Eu sou Cauê Otávio, coordenador do Nejap, Núcleo de Estudos Japoneses da UFSC. E nos últimos anos eu tenho pesquisado sobre samurais, especialmente entre os séculos 13 e 14. Por conta disso, foi Pessoalmente, uma grande honra para mim ter nesse evento a presença do professor Thomas Conlan na abertura e agora, no encerramento, a presença de outro professor que, cujos trabalhos foram para nós importantíssimos na nossa formação, que é o professor Paul Friday. Tratam-se de, de dois dos maiores nomes da, da área em língua inglesa. Né? Alguns avisos breves. É, que já foram dados na live de abertura, mas, por via das dúvidas, lá vão. A chamada vai ser veiculada, o link da chamada vai ser veiculado aqui pelo chat, depois da apresentação do professor Friday e antes da, da sessão de perguntas e respostas. Ok? Então, a live, a primeira metade da live vai ser destinada a apresentação e a segunda metade a perguntas e respostas. Como a gente sabe que a caixa de chat do YouTube é muito limitada, a gente criou um formulário para questões, para envio de questões, que encontra-se aí na descrição do vídeo. Eu vou abrir esse formulário agora para vocês poderem enviar suas perguntas durante a palestra. Eu peço para que enviem as perguntas por este formulário. Se puderem enviá-las em inglês, melhor. Se não, se tiverem que enviá-las em português, não há problema. Nós faremos o possível para tentar traduzi-las da melhor forma possível. Né? Hoje sou só eu aqui apresentando junto com o professor Friday. Eu não consegui me comunicar com a Larissa, infelizmente. Eu acho que ela está em viagem até. É... Então, quanto ao chat, utilizem ele para enviar, para fazer comentários e, e para conversar com os demais colegas. Fiquem à vontade, só tentem deixar as perguntas para o formulário, ok? Tendo dito isso, eu apresento o, o nosso convidado de hoje. Com muito prazer para o encerramento desse evento. É, eu chamo o, o professor Paul Friday para a tela. Professor Friday, just a bit. So, o, o professor Carl Friday atualmente é aposentado e ele tem os títulos de Professor Emeritus pela University of Georgia e University of Saitama tendo uma vasta produção bibliográfica em seu nome. Eu destaco brevemente aqui alguns trabalhos dele, o Hired Swords, onde ele analisa o que a gente convenciona a chamar de samurais lá no seu período de surgimento, no começo do, do período Heian, ele vai até antes, na verdade. Samurai Warfare and the State in Early Medieval Japan, onde ele analisa os samurais do período Heian até o início do século XIV, mostrando mudanças e permanências na ética de guerra, no etos dos guerreiros, nos armamentos, nas táticas, etc. E The First Samurai, onde ele faz um, um estudo de caso minucioso sobre o, o Tyrano Massacado e a rebelião do Tyrano Massacado no século X. A partir de agora, eu vou estar falando em inglês, para me comunicar com o professor e com a nossa audiência em língua inglesa, mas, quando necessário, falarei com vocês em português também. É... 
E é isso. É... Now, uh, a quick word for our fellow students and researchers from abroad. First of all, welcome to our event. As was the case with Professor Colin, our former guest, Professor Friday, Friday, our current guest, is also a very widely known scholar from the field. Nonetheless, I find it important to, to give you all a brief introduction as I did to our Brazilian audience right now. Professor Friday is currently retired and has the title of Professor Emeritus by the University of Georgia and the University of Saitama. Among his many works, we can highlight Hard Swords, where he analyzes what we commonly call samurai in the, their earliest manifestations during the Heian period, even earlier with the Gundan system of military conscription by the Imperial Ditsuryo State. Sorry for my butchered pronunciation, by the way. Uh, samurai were from the state in early medieval Japan, where he thoroughly presents many aspects of the samurai from the Heian period up to the end of the Kamakura period and the beginning of the 14th century. And in this book, well, it's, it's a fascinating read where he analyzes the ethics of war, uh, the war ethos, war tactics and technology, war culture and all in, in many different aspects and, and very well-defined chapters. And lastly, The First Samurai, an excellent case study of Tyrano Masakado life and rebellion, as well as the world he lived in. Now, having said all that, with my terrible English pronunciation, it is my pleasure to present to you all Professor Carl Friday. Professor, the stage is yours. <laughs> We are delighted and very grateful to have you here. And in a sense, as much as we can, welcome to Brazil. So please, <laughs> be your guest. All right, well, will, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Oh, I will disappear right now and, and let you take the stage quite literally. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, and thank you for inviting me today. Uh, this is uh, quite fun and uh, interesting to do it uh, uh, on the internet instead of actually being able to travel like good in ancient times, but uh, <laughs> see what happens from there. Hopefully the technology all works and such. So yeah, um, let's talk about warriors. Um, the, uh, let's see, it's like, oops, one second. I'm sure the slideshow is working. There we go. All right, so let's start with a story here. Um, this is a story a lot of you probably know. Let me apologize, by the way, for doing this in English, but I have about three words of Portuguese, so it would be impossible. <laughs> anyway, um, in 1701, a, a young uh, and recently uh, uh, succeeded Lord of Akodomin, uh, a warrior by the name of Asano Nagatori, Uh, was serving in the castle of the shogunate, of the shogun, Tokugawa Tsunayoshi in, in uh, Edo, which is now Tokyo. And he was selected to assist with the reception of uh, some envoys from the imperial court. Uh, he was assigned uh, a ranking master of protocol, a guy by the name of Kira Yoshinaka, to get instruction in the fine points of etiquette and such. Um, somehow, Asano seems to have annoyed Kira. Uh, and 
uh, Kita managed to humiliate him publicly on several occasions. The traditional story is that Kita wanted bribes that, that Asano wasn't paying, but that's there's no evidence for that. But in any case, Kita does seem to have embarrassed him publicly. And Asano, who seems to have been more uh, uh, driven by youthful righteous indignation than being smart, uh, decided to ambush Kita. So he attacked him in the halls of the uh, shogun's castle and cut him with his sword, but he didn't kill him. Uh, and uh, that was a problem I'll come back to in a second. But show, in any case, shogun law on this sort of thing is very clear and very strict. Drawing a weapon under any circumstances within the confines of the shogun's castle is a capital offense. Doesn't matter what the reason, there's no excuse for it. Uh, and accordingly, Asano was ordered to uh, uh, commit suicide, which is essentially the capital punishment execution form for samurai, and his domain was then confiscated. In the aftermath of that decision by the shogunate, the uh, principal retainers of the now uh, abolished Asano domain met to plot revenge. Uh, led by their chief retainer, Oishi Kuronosuke Yoshio, uh, they came up with a very complex plan. And the idea here was that in order to uh, avoid the suspicions of Kita and shogunal officials, who would naturally have been expecting this sort of vendetta, they agreed to split up and they hid out for some time. And two year, about, almost two years later, they reassembled after, by which time Kita had had plenty of time to forget about the incident and relax his guard. And then on the 14th night of the 12th lunar month of 1702, they struck. Uh, by this time, there were only 47 of the Asano, uh, former Asano samurai left, but they assembled, they attacked and killed Kita at his home in Edo. Uh, they delivered his head to Asano's grave. And then, interestingly, they surrendered themselves to shogunal authorities. After a great deal of debate, the shogun had ordered them all to commit suicide. So those, that's the bones of the story, though, right? Uh, this is one of the most famous and uh, uh, sort of parables, or, or it's not a parable because it's a true story, but it's one of the most famous stories and edifying tales about samurai loyalty and honor from actually all of Japanese history, but particularly from the Tokugawa period. But there's a very interesting irony here to the story's fame and its popularity. First of all, you know, popularly, of course, it's, it's often described as the ultimate example of samurai loyalty and honor. Um, and it was had that effect on popular audiences right from the beginning, within days of, of the incident making the news. Uh, but the reality is that the events and the actions of the principals involved here were much more controversial among government officials and other experts, uh, especially at the time, than most people realize. Uh, so the story is really interesting because it does a good job of illustrating the complexity of samurai thoughts and ideals concerning constructs like concepts like honor and loyalty. Um, the shogunate's decision was one thing, but as I just suggested, public sentiment at the time and ever since has always come down on the side of the Roni. The story was almost immediately fictionalized into a stage drama, and it subsequently has served as the plot for at least a half dozen or more movies. And also the, uh, the militarists of the modern pre-war 20th century saw the Asano retainers as the embodiment of samurai virtue. Then you have along with that, uh, the fascinating irony, I don't, some of you may have seen this movie, the uh, Mizoguchi Kenji version of, of Chushin Gura. It's a wonderful story because Mizoguchi was uh, very late in the war, uh, approached by the government and chewed out because it, it was criticized because he hadn't done a good propaganda movie yet. Uh, so you aren't, you aren't making any really any prop or uh, patriotic movies. We need a, a, a great example of this uh, from you. Uh, otherwise, we're not going to continue to allow you to get film stock and make other movies. So uh, Mizuguchi was a leftist and, and a pacifist and absolutely did not want to cooperate. But he came up with this very clever way of doing it. And he made turned this very exciting patriotic 
uh, militaristic story into the most boring soap opera that he possibly could so that it wouldn't inspire anybody. And so he was able to sort of skirt across the rules and, and, uh, and say, well, it's not my fault. Uh, it's wonderful. It's about two and a half, three hours. And there isn't a single bit of action in the entire movie. The big scene where uh, the Ronin finally attack Lord Kida and kill him and bring his head back is all covered in a letter that uh, somebody sends to uh, uh, the, uh, the wives. Um, I think it's the widow of Asano. If I remember right, somebody sends her a letter and she reads the letter saying, oh, yeah, they just attacked and killed him. And the, the, the rest of the movie is all just soap opera like drama and, 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 and such. But anyway, um, evaluations of the incident also varied widely among the early 18th century so-called authorities on proper samurai behavior. A huge amount of debate going on within the shogunate as to what to do with these guys and why. Um, if you want to read that, it, it's most uh, most of it's been translated into English in uh, uh, the new version of Sources of Japanese Tradition, the Columbia University uh, two volume series, uh, has most of the debates there. They're, they're fascinating reading. Uh, on the one hand, you have authorities like uh, Ogyu Sorat and uh, the Zaishundai and several others who criticized the Ronin for putting their personal feelings above their higher duty to uphold the law and to protect the public order. Like, you know, this is, you may be emotional about your master, but this is wrong. Uh, on the other hand, you have Hayashi Nobukatsu, uh, Miyake Kandan and, other, and still others that are doing just the opposite, talking about how uh, wonderful they are for their purity of motives and selfless nobility of actions. They surrendered and they committed suicide willingly and et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe the most significant condemnation of all of them came from Yamamoto Jocho, who's also sometimes known as Tsunemoto. Jocho is actually his priestly name. Tsune Tomo is, is a Japanese rereading of that. In any case, um, Jocho is the author of a famous text called Hagakure, which I'm sure some of you at least have, have, have come across. Uh, it's one of the two or three most famous, at least outside of Japan, expositions of proper warrior behavior. It's been translated a half dozen times into English, and there is at least one French and one Spanish translation that I know of. I think there's a German translation as well. Uh, but in any case, here you've got Jocho, that, that uh, was particularly popular, by the way, the Hagakure with the uh, uh, the pre-modern or pre-war Japanese military, the army. But Jocho saw the Ronin's actions as way too calculating and too rational. Said so he he was terribly disturbed by the idea that they waited and plotted and that they they sat and, and hid out for two years uh, with the idea of of uh, uh, making having a better chance of succeeding in the vendetta. Because, you know, succeeding is not the point for Jocho's version of Bushido, said they should have rushed to attack Kida immediately without being concerned at all whether they, whether they would win or not. That's not the point. Wonderful quote here. This is a translation by uh, Alex Bennett, but uh, their intentions would have been to not had Kida Yoshinaka died of illness during their long wait. Citified men like the Asano Ronin are clever and they know all the angles to show themselves off for praise. But, and he goes on to say, this is not the way a true warrior should be conducting himself. Um, and of course, there are a lot of other interesting angles to this uh, Chishigura or 47 Ronin story. For one thing, you have Asano himself. He's incompetent. He's hot-headed. He's rude. He completely disregarded the law and disregarded protocol. Um, he did not exactly take on a, you know, it wasn't a heroic fight against a worthy opponent. The, his uh, enemy here was a doddering old man. Uh, it was a sudden attack. He didn't challenge him to a duel. He ambushed him and slashed at him with his sword, and he failed to kill him uh, in spite of that. You know, I, I, a picture I've always had in my mind is like a bar fight when some little guy finally loses his temper and starts swinging and not accomplishing anything. And you also have the behavior of the Ronin themselves. Um, the... Uh, uh, this very flawed lord, and yet they stay absolutely loyal to him. And the attack on Kido, of course, was a sneak attack. They didn't challenge him to a duel or 
uh, or line up outside his, his home and, and demand he come out to fight or anything of the sort. They ambushed him as well. Uh, and of course, you have the famous, uh, the central part of all the Chushin Guru movies and, and the, uh, uh, the Kabuki play and, and the uh, uh, Bundaku puppet version of this, where he spends two years debauching, um, hanging out and drinking and going to houses of prostitution and things to make it look like he's forgotten all about his samurai duties and, and such. Uh, he's behaving publicly and uh, ostentatiously very un samurai like throughout this. So all of that basically brings us to a very important truth. And that is that both popular writers and scholars talk a great deal about samurai values and ethical norms. And all of this talk tends to suggest that there's a relatively, that, some, that there was a samurai code of conduct that was relatively unified and relatively well-defined but that is terribly misleading. Um, there are all sorts of problems here. First of all, the term itself, Bushido, uh, it was never, never used before the Tokugawa period, before the 17th century, and almost never used during the uh, uh, Tokugawa period, before the 20th century, it was almost never used. In fact, the single most famous book on Bushido uh, in any language, uh, was uh, Nitobe Inazo's Bushido, The Soul of Japan, which we actually was written in English initially and then translated back to Japanese, written in 1899. Uh, Nitobe actually thought he'd made up the term. It was so uncommon, but he just, he wanted, he, the, the concept he said was universal, but, the, uh, the, but there was no word for it. Um, and more importantly, and my main point today, it, Bushido has no set meaning in spite of what coffee table books and general histories and books on martial arts and, and such tend to try to, to argue ad nauseum. It's simply not true. The whole idea of proper samurai behavior and values was always a very vague concept, at least until the 20th century. Um, and samurai values changed again and again and again over time from period to period, particularly moving from the medieval period into the early modern period. Um, even during the Tokugawa period, the time of the Akko Ronin incident, there was a lot of debate, but very little agreement. I like to tell students that the term Bushido basically belongs to the same class of words as terms like patriotism or masculinity or femininity which is to say pretty much everyone agrees that these are good qualities to possess. Very few women would like to be told they're not feminine. Very few people are comfortable being told you're not patriotic at all. Yes, I am, but it's always that yes, I am, but, right? That uh, what does that, what do you mean by patriotic? You know, is Edward Snowden a patriot or is uh, uh, Geert Wilders a patriot? Uh, they would both say, of course I am, uh, and their supporters would say, no, the other side isn't. Uh, is Angela Merkel more feminine or less feminine than Marilyn Monroe? Um, you know, you can go on and on and on. Like, and Bushido works that way too. It's something, you know, of course, I, I'm a proper samurai. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, when you get down to the details, everybody's different. It was in fact actually very little discussion, at least in writing, of proper warrior behavior before the Tokugawa period. That is before the, the uh, 1600s. Um, the concept of a code of conduct for samurai period is a, very much a product of the 17th and 18th century. And this is, as many of you probably know, a period when Japan was at peace, not uh, the medieval age of the country at war. Um, the early modern period, the Tokugawa period, marked by three really, really dramatic changes to warrior circumstances. Um, first of all, samurai were converted for the first time to a legally privileged hereditary caste. Sometimes say class, but 
I don't like caste either because it sounds religious, but class isn't quite right because class has economic implications to it. But in any case, being a samurai was a matter of birth for the first time ever in Japanese history. A transformation here from an occupational group that was defined mainly by possession of certain skills to a socio-political uh, order or class or caste or whatever term you prefer, uh, in which membership was almost, not 100%, almost purely hereditary. There were exceptions. It was possible to get into the samurai class or to be kicked out of it, but it was almost impossible for that to happen. Second big point, the samurai were moved off the land. Until the late 16th century, samurai had been mostly landed lords, for lack of a better term for it, feudal lords. Um, but in the late 1500s, uh, warlords, daimyo, began pulling their men off the land. This was partly a pure, purely military consideration uh, because of new tactics and use of castles and more frequent fighting and, and that sort of thing. They wanted to have their men in a garrison close to them where they could use them quickly. Uh, but even more, it was done as a way to make them less independent, more dependent on the overlord, on the daimyo. This process continued through the early 1600s. So that by the mid 17th century, most uh, samurai were living in castle towns on stipends, on salary, essentially. Uh, by 1700, 90% of the samurai class had no direct ties to land. They simply lived off of a salary paid by their overlord. And the third big change, a virtual end to fighting in Japan. Samurai at this point forward spent their time as government bureaucrats and over time, not battlefield warriors. So over time, uh, they tended to become much more bureaucrats who were descended from warriors than warriors acting as bureaucrats. It's just generation after generation, 250 years of virtually no fighting, just small scale police sorts of things here and there and personal, you know, uh, vendettas and whatever. Well, all of this together, of course, not surprisingly, dramatically changed the basic relationship between lords and vassals. Uh, it was no longer a mutual tie, which it always had been. I'll come back to that point in just a minute. It was now a one-sided tie in which vassals, retainers, were utterly dependent on their overlord. Um, the vassals uh, the uh, bond of loyalty became much less personal. It's not loyalty to the man so much as the, the position of daimyo. Pledge of loyalty becomes ritualized in that sense. Um, daimyo less the personal leader, a personal leader for warriors than simply the head of the bureaucratic hierarchy in which they, from which they drew their livelihood. Uh, loyalty was directed more and more essentially in reality to the domain, not to the Lord as a person. It no longer mattered what kind of person he was. He could be an infant, he could be an imbecile. It didn't matter because he was the head of the domain and that's what's important. So you're moving to something, toward something anyway, that's somewhat more resembling modern patriotism than the kind of traditional medieval ideas about loyalty. So that by the end of the Edo period, end of the Tokugawa period, by the time you get into the late 19th century when everything and the Meiji period, samurai had become a whole new socio-political class from what they had been in terms of lifestyle, personality, and almost anything else you want to name, they would probably have been completely unrecognizable to their ancestors. If you pop somebody out of the mid 1500s into the early 1900s, uh, or 1800s rather, he would have been very confused at what he saw. Um, but by the same token, very few early modern warriors would have admitted that things were different. They would say, oh, well, yeah, I mean, circumstances are, are different, but these are superficial changes. Um, at least, I'm cer certainly there are warriors who don't really behave like warriors anymore, but, but still, most of us are true samurai, and we're not any different from my great-great-grandfather. Everything is really the same at heart. Um, 
Well, of course, again, it wasn't. And as the reality of this new situation began to set in over the course of a generation or two, it gave birth to a tremendous kind of identity crisis for samurai. You have a fundamental problem here of defining someone who is supposed to be a warrior. How do you define the role of a fighting man in a period when, in a, in a world where there's no fighting? Um, and this identity crisis was in fact the main problem that's being, that was being addressed by all of the various self-styled authorities who wrote about Bushido during the Tokugawa period. The term Bushido then literally means, of course, way of the warrior, but it's probably better translated in terms of its practical meaning as the way of the not quite a warrior, given the circumstances of the, uh, of, of the people who, who really developed the concept. It's a philosophy concerning the nature of what warriors are supposed to be like, formulated by men who had never been anywhere near a battlefield and probably never been in a fight. So you have this tremendous malaise, the self-doubt uh, concerning the role of uh, a fighting man in an era in which there's no fighting. Probably the best single best statement of the problem is the one you see on the screen here. Uh, it's a quote from uh, Yamaga Soko, who was uh, uh, one of the most uh, important of the Bushido writers and, and uh, uh, instructor to, uh, to shoguns at various points in his life. Um, I won't read it to you, you can read it for yourself, but um, Yamaga's ideas, his answers to this question and the answers that were coming from other writers on Bushido became uh, uh, particularly concerning honor and other form, bits of behavior became formalized and ritualized and often quaint and pedantic and pontificating uh, and totally unrealistic in many cases. Now, this is a process that was repeated multiple times moving into the, uh, uh, into the modern area, era, rather, excuse me. In the early Meiji period, you have uh, Japan becoming very self-conscious in the face of Westernization on uh, the arrival of uh, uh, the Americans and, and European powers that re reopened Japan and, and uh, dragged Japan into, suddenly into the world order. You have the, the Russo-Japanese war era at the uh, uh, very beginning of the 20th century, uh, which uh, where Japan uh, uh, defeated the largest army in the world and, uh, and the largest military power in the world. And suddenly you have this wonderful new kind of national self-confidence. The World War I era, where Japan did pretty well, but also was once again reminded of uh, just how big a technological gap and an industrial gap still existed between Japan and uh, the Western powers. You have the early Showa era, the pre-war era, where uh, the emerging militarism and the imperial way the philosophies and such that, that uh, co-opt uh, uh, Bushido. You have the post-war era, where it was, uh, where uh, official policy, government policy, and educational policy initially very much rejected this, and then as you start moving into the the genuine post-war era in the seventies, eighties, nineties, a re-emerging right wing that's once again trying to pick up old ideas of Bushido, which they don't really remember, and, and shaping them for their own interests. You have the wonderful phenomenon going on in the uh, in the eighties of of uh, uh, a whole series of books, and one of them in the corner there, uh, The Samurai on Wall Street, that all Japanese are really just under scratch the surface and underneath you'll find a samurai and the Japanese business strategy as Japan is reemerging as a major business power uh, was all based on old samurai ideals and, and samurai values and such. And of course, what all of these mo moments in time have in common is of course the question of identity. Japan's place in the world. Uh, and all of these groups at different times seized on the idea of Bushido and said, this is the essence of Japanese national identity, but they weren't the same Bushidos. They were always changing and fit, making them fit 
the situation of, of the times. So once again, you have tremendous diversity to this construct, dozens of competing and incompatible ideas. Uh, Bushido is basically a catch-all, an omnibus construct. It means whatever the writer wants it to mean. Again, very much like patriotism or masculinity or femininity does. Um, and I think with most of these descriptions of Bushido, the modern descriptions, including the Tokugawa period ones, early modern descriptions had almost no basis in historical reality. So let's look a little more closely at that. And uh, I'm gonna pick on these two constructs, uh, loyalty and honor, and see how they uh, really unfolded in earlier times. Honor, of course, is a very slippery uh, and difficult concept to work with. And, in, and you have to be very, very careful with it. In everyday conversation and such, we tend to act as if it's some kind of transcendent, universal uh, idea, and it's timeless. But it's clearly not. It's universal, perhaps in, in its value, which is to say that I think that most cultures, most places and times, probably you can identify something that's analogous to that English word honor, you know, a value that sort of fits that. But um, so, you know, the idea that there's something that some, something we would call honor, that you could translate as honor that fits every culture is, is arguably universal. And I think you can debate that even. But definitely the specifics of what behaviors are and are not considered honorable in any given place and time vary tremendously. They're very specific to each where and each when. In medieval Japan, honor and reputation were absolutely at the heart of a warrior's self-perception. But you notice I say honor and reputation because in fact, there is no word in Japanese for honor that actually fits except coming back and translating it into uh, uh, the neologism, uh, meio, which is really a, a, a creation, a modern, more or less modern creation, it's a Chinese word really, uh, to fit Western words like honor. Um, the, uh, uh, if you look at what people are discussing that we easily and, and lightly translate as honor over and over again in, in uh, actual historical documents, they're using a wide variety of names, mostly things like name, reputation, standing, appearance, things like that that have to do with, with so reputation is actually more, probably a better translation here. But in any case, uh, his reputation, his, his ideas of what we might call honor are very much at the heart of his self-perception. Uh, reputation, honor, warrior pride, almost tangible entities. They took precedence over virtually all obligations. For the sake of their reputations, you see warriors refusing orders from superiors, risking the loss of valuable allies and retainers, often even sometimes even murdering men to whom they owe their own lives, even sacrificing their own lives. Um, slights to reputation and honor could be catalysts to belligerence and bloodshed. Uh, breaches of etiquette and failure to show proper respect uh, often led to violent consequences. One rather entertaining example, and I'm using that pun intentionally here, was reported in a text called Azuma Kagami, which is the first shogun, the, the Kamakura shogun, it's official um, uh, historical record of itself. This happened in 1241 when a warrior by the name of Miura Yasumura uh, up and some of his relatives were having a drinking and dancing party in a uh, uh, lascivious house is the best way I can translate this term near a bridge in Kamakura. Meanwhile, warriors of the Yuki, Oyama and Naganuma households were having a similar party at the other end of the same bridge. At some point during the party, uh, Yuki Tonomo, uh, Tomomura took it into his head to practice some long distance archery. He was probably completely drunk by this time. And so he began chasing and shooting at a dog outside the house. Unfortunately, one of his arrows went wild and it ended up in a screen in the house where the Miura were having their party. Uh, Tomomura sent a servant to ask for the arrow back. 
the uh, uh, Miura refused to give it to him and instead scolded him for his rudeness. They began to argue and before long, both sides were rushing out of the house, drawing swords and pulling bows and, and, uh, and they actually started calling in other troops, mounted troops and you had a full scale battle going. Um, honor or its opposite, shame, could in fact reach beyond a warrior himself, even beyond his lifespan. A uh, warrior could prosper through inherited glory from his ancestors or suffer the stigma of ancestral disgraces. Excuse me. Um, filial piety and familial reputa reputation were a common ca cause for warfare. Um, so large scale vendettas of the sort that you see in Europe uh, were surprisingly rare, but attempts to avenge slights or crimes against family members were a big enough problem to be mentioned in uh, specifically in shogun law of both of the first two shogunates, the Kamakura and Muromachi regimes. In many cases, uh, even a warrior's life could be less important to him than his name and his image. You have uh, all sorts of uh, incidents in accounts of battles uh, of warriors choosing to sacrifice themselves in order to enhance their reputation or uh, the reputation of their families. All of that is interesting and that fits more or less, I think, with, with modern ideas of Bushido, but you have to be very, very careful here about making what are tr can be tremendously anachronistic or provincial ethnocentric assumptions about the nature of samurai honor. Uh, it's true, as I was just I've been arguing here, that concepts of honor and shame were profoundly important to warrior identity. But honor, at least until the Tokugawa period, turned mainly on a warrior's military reputation. And that depended first and foremost on his record of victories. So unlike European, med medieval European chivalry, which was at least in part a prescriptive and also proscriptive code of conduct, early medieval Japanese equivalents like the way of the horse and bow and such were simply, the, the terms were simply a vocational description. Uh, unlike their European counterparts, Japanese warriors, bushi, samurai, were very seldom, if ever, faced with choosing between military advantage and adherence to chivalric norms. Medieval Japanese concepts of honor and honorable conduct in battle were tremendously flexible. Uh, it permitted a surprisingly wide range of behaviors, some of which, of course, are very much in harmony with modern notions of honor as uh, modern and the inner Western audiences would understand it, and others which would be shocking or are shockingly uh, dishonorable when we hear about them. So let's take a look at just a few of those. Let me give you some examples here. One of the most famous anecdotes about early samurai behavior is a conflict between two early 10th century warriors, Minamoto Mitsuru and Taira Yoshifumi. Uh, gossip between the two started a quarrel, resulting in a challenge to combat. Both sides exchanged documents, uh, agreeing to meet on the field on a specified day. Uh, both put their troops in order and got ready to fight. And then on the agreed upon day, uh, the two brought their war bands out onto the field. They met and they agreed upon place. They set up their lines, they exchanged documents uh, and uh, sent two warriors out to exchange documents. And as those warriors ride back to their ranks, there was what the text calls a customary flurry of arrows. And a wonderful line here, the warriors did not look back or even hurry their horses forward, but returned quietly, thus displaying their bravery. At this point, both sides moved their shields closer together and were about to begin shooting generally at one another when Yoshifumi supposedly calls out to Mitsuru and says, to simply set our respective troops Discharging arrows at one another does not serve the interest of today's battle. Let only you and I learn of each other's skill. Instead of having our troops engage, how about if only the two of us ride at one another and take our best shots? Mitsuda says, sure, why not? 
<laughs> and so he tells his men to stay out of the fight and says, don't get into it even if I lose, and then rides out to fight Dushumi alone. The two of them make several passes at one another. They're shooting on horseback, shooting arrows at each other on horseback, but neither is able to, dis to score a decisive shot. And at some point, after a couple of tries, they agree to call it a tie. Yashfumi says, we have seen all of each other's tricks. There is no lack of skill here. We are not traditional enemies from of old. Uh, let us stop here and now. This is only a challenge. We need not feel compelled to kill one another. And so having settled their quarrel uh, reasonably well here, they spend the rest of their lives as friends. Now, of course, the behavior of Mitsuru and Yoshifumi in this story fits very, very well with popular images of samurai behavior. In fact, it's one of the principal sources cited in support of several of the key tenets of these modern ideas. But it contrasts incredibly starkly with another account in exactly the same text. This is from the Konjaku Monogatari Shu, a 12th century tale collection. Um, this one involves two other 10th century warriors, Taira Koremochi and Fujiwara Moroto. Uh, once again, same thing, a, a dispute over a piece of land begins to develop, uh, fueled by gossip, the challenge is issued, a date of a uh, place to fight is agreed on. But as the day of battle approaches, this time Moroto looks up and realizes he's going to be outnumbered about three to one and decides that famous line, discretion is the better part of valor. And so he simply runs off to a neighboring province and, and doesn't show up. And what's interesting is the text that records the tale tells us that, this is a quote, those who spoke between the two warriors pronounced favorably on this. This wasn't dishonorable. Running away, it's just being smart. It's being pragmatic. Korimochi gets the news that Moroto has run and says, okay, fine, everything is safe, and he demobilizes his men. But shortly thereafter, Korimochi and his household are awakened in the middle of the night by Moroto approaching his home with a sizable force. Moroto's men surround Korimochi's housing compound, they set fire to buildings, and they begin to shoot down anyone who runs out of the, the, the home, the house, trying to escape the fire. Uh, when the fire has burned itself out, they search through the ashes. And this is a quote, discovering men of high, uh, high and low rank, children and the like, all told more than 80 persons burned to death. So then they pack up and, and head for Moroto's home. On the way back, he stops at the home of his brother-in-law to give his troops a rest. The brother-in-law won't let him come into the house, but he does uh, send out food and, and sake drinks uh, for them to celebrate with. And uh, so they set up camp and, and they drink and, and get uh, and, and eat until they pass out. Well, those of you that are movie fans <laughs> and are good at reading movie plots and things have probably already guessed that Korimochi is not dead. Uh, he, uh, he had in fact escaped from the house by stealing a robe from one of his serving women and slipped past the attackers under the cover of smoke. And then he hid in, in the reeds in a nearby stream until the fighting was over and Moroto's troops had withdrawn. Um, the next morning, some of his troops who've heard about the fight and are uh, coming from their homes to find him, uh, look for him and they find him hiding in the, in, the, in the stream. They resupply him with clothing and weapons and a horse and he explains exactly what happened and saying, insisting, well, I could have fled into the mountains, of course, at the beginning of the attack, but I didn't because I feared that, and again, a quote, this would leave behind the reputation of one who had run away. Well, guess what? You did run away and you do have a reputation at this point. His men though say, well, okay, fine. We need to counterattack. Let's reassemble all of the, the troops and then we can attack him. Um, because at this point, Moroto's Still got his whole army together and, he, and his troops outnumber them five or six to one. But Koremoto refuses. He says, had I been burned to death inside my house last night, would my life exist now? I escaped in this manner at great cost, yet I do not truly live. To show myself to you for even one day is shameful. Therefore, I will not be stingy with this do-like life. You may assemble an army and fight later. As for myself, 
I will go on to attack, even if alone. No doubt I will send off only a single arrow and then die. But to choose otherwise would be a limitless shame for my descendants. Again, a very movie-like <laughs> sort of speech, right? Uh, Kore Mochi, though, then takes the troops that he's got and they find Moroto and attack them, taking them completely by surprise because Moroto's men are unarmed, they're drunk, most of them are asleep, uh, and they offer only a token defense, and pretty soon they're all killed. So Korimoshi does not make the mistake that Moroto did. He makes sure that Moroto's dead, takes his head, and moves on to Moroto's home, which he also burns down and kills everybody in it. So here, there are other interesting details to the story, but I'm gonna leave that there. But in any case, Korimochi's obsession here with honor is noteworthy, but it's very complicated. Um, the challenge, the agreement on place and time, the refusal to run at the beginning of the attack all fit pretty well with our expectations of, of honor. Um, so does his speech to his men after they find him. But his method of escape, the counter strike, the gratuitous destruction of Moroto's house, um, they don't fit so well. Uh, so in spite of very similar be beginnings, the conflicts between Yoshifumi and Mitsuru and the one between Moroto and Korimochi proceed in very stark contrast to one another, uh, which is hard to explain. It may be that Yoshifumi versus Mitsuru is sort of an idealized image of earlier uh, warriors by somewhat later warriors, a kind of creative nostalgia on the part of 12th century writers who wrote the tale down. It's clearly exceptional in any case. It doesn't fit with what we see in most other battle anecdotes from the period and, and, and after, but it is there. So these ideas had to be there. It was part of the consciousness in the 12th century concerning warrior honor. Uh, but really important to remember that the same audiences that were impressed by Yoshifumi and Mitsuru also considered Korimochi to be heroic. Um, another really interesting story from Azuma Kagami. Again, like this is the Kamakura Shogunate's own uh, didactic record of its, of its history, uh, recounts how the, the regime founder, Minamoto Yoritomo, had one of his men executed for treason, uh, summoning him to his headquarters, and, or to his quarters anyway, and entertaining him with food and drink, uh, in the midst of which all of a sudden, well, uh, uh, the uh, uh, retainer was, was, was uh, drinking and partying, uh, another retainer, Amano Tokage, stepped forward with a sword and lopped off the unfortunate guy's head. And again, the key point here is that in all of these stories, these are not other groups criticizing warriors. These are groups, uh, uh, particularly the, the stories from Azuma Kagami, which are written by warriors for warriors, or at least for warriors. Uh, in all of these stories, the acceptance of both warrior and non-warrior audiences for this kind of, what we would think of as very treacherous, even cowardly behavior, is striking. There's no suggestion in any of these accounts that this is improper conduct or in any way dishonorable. Um, one reason uh, why behavior in these uh, tales seems so uncomfortably dishonorable to us today, I think, is the role of deception and guile. Now, this is a really old idea, of course, in Japanese tradition. The fondness for surprise attacks uh, and artifice goes on forever. It goes as far back as the Koji, in the, uh, uh, written in the uh, early 8th century, and at least as recently as the Pacific War. It's probably one of the dominant themes in Japan's martial legacy. But of course, a, a fondness for surprise attacks and ambush is not in any way unique to Japan. European knights and barons and such also built very happily on tactics of betrayal and deception to secure victory. So did uh, cultures all over the world and at all sorts of times. Uh, in medieval Europe, though, which is most commonly compared to Japan, uh, you see the use of guile and tricks in almost every aspect of warfare, even in tournaments. But, and, and very seldom, uh, does that result in somebody being uh, criticized? 
uh, by the people who chronicle who recorded the stories. Knights applauded cunning and guile and surprise, again, even in tournaments. But even so, the Japanese attitude on this issue really stands out because in Europe, deception was acceptable only within strictly defined limits. There were conventions of war that were designed to regulate fighting to the mutual benefit of both sides in the struggle, in part because war was sort of a way to make a living in the medieval period more than a conflict between peoples like it becomes in the, in the modern period. Uh, but in any case, um, deception and, and surprise and such were legitimate only because of use, use of clever legalistic sorts of loopholes in the rules. Uh, they arose directly. The, the fact that they work comes from formalized conventions of oaths and truces and declarations and challenges. So in other words, low cunning was not in itself dishonorable, but perjury, going back on an oath promising to abstain from uh, from surprise attacks or from any kind of attack or whatever was considered dishonorable. But Japanese custom lacked all such qualifications. Promises and truces were violated left and right with absolutely no reputation consequences. Um, Minamoto Yoritomo demonstrated this again, the, the Kamakura Shogun founder in a campaign against Satake Hideyoshi in 1184. Hideyoshi had put himself behind fortifications and Yoritomo was having trouble getting him out. Uh, so he used a relative of his, Taira Hirotsune, as an intermediary, persuaded Hide, uh, Hideyoshi's father, Yoshimasa, to meet him alone at the center of a bridge leading to Yoshimasa's home. And again, by the way, this also comes from Azuma Kagami. But when Yoshimasa reached the meeting point, Hirotsune simply killed him uh, and caused Yoshimasa's followers to surrender and the rest to flee. So again, this is not dishonorable behavior to the people reading the stories. Han period audiences, class, late classical audiences considered surprise attacks so normal and so fair that uh, an early 11th century text begins its description of what it calls the greatest warrior in the land by informing us that, it's a quote, he was highly skilled in the conduct of battles, night attacks, archery duels on horseback, and ambushes. That's two out of four of his most important credentials are sneaky things, right? Um, now this, again, uh, it's easy to start going, rolling your eyes and saying, wow, I guess Japanese were treacherous, uh, which is of course exactly the attitude that appears in World War, in the World War II era among the, and shortly after among Western commentators. But that's not an accurate way to look at this either. You have to bear in mind the degree to which that kind of judgment reflects ethnocentric or anachronistic standards for behavior. Uh, measured against the war conventions of their own time and place, these medieval warrior tactics were not any less noble or heroic, certainly no more treacherous or underhanded than those of their European contemporaries or even of Western literary heroes. Japanese rules of conduct simply demanded that warriors concern themselves only with the most efficient means to bring about the desired result. Nothing else really mattered, and the ends justified virtually any means. Now, there's a famous idea of a, uh, that you see talked about in, in uh, uh, modern commentaries on Japanese martial art or modern Bushido commentaries suggesting that uh, warriors were expected to be on guard all the time and, and always prepared, always expecting an attack. And I think there's some truth to that. Um, to the extent that that's real, and those expectations are real, that goes a long way toward explaining this apparent lack of sportsmanship in, uh, in Japanese warfare. If you're always supposed to be on guard, then uh, uh, taking your opponent by surprise, catching him unprepared, isn't unfair. It's uh, um, no different than attacking an opponent through an opening in his guard in a formal fencing mask or match or pulling off a good head fake move in, in a basketball game. You're supposed to be watching. If I can get you to go the wrong way and shoot, that's your problem. I'm not being, I'm not cheating. Okay, so second major theme in Chushingura and other 
popular notions of samurai values is the idea of loyalty. The loyalty of a samurai is often said to have been unconditional and absolutely selfish. And of course, that is the, the, the lesson of Tushingura. Um, exhortations to loyalty are also a major theme in shogun law and in daimyo house laws, both in the early modern period and even going back to the medieval period. And of course, ad nauseum in 17th and 18th, 18th century treatises on Bushido. But there are real problems with involved in interpreting from those kind of texts that loyalty was a fundamental part of medieval warrior character. Uh, for one thing, because unrestricted, the idea of, of the unrestricted loyalty that subjects owe their rulers was a basic tenet of Confucianism. It had nothing to do with warriors. It goes back to ancient China. Uh, it pre predates the, even the existence of the Japanese nation by hundreds of years. And it has nothing to do with military affairs per se. So when daimyo and shoguns were calling on their samurai to render them unflinching loyalty, they were really just demanding from their subjects uh, behavior along the lines of traditional, uh, traditional uh, and general theme of government. It really is nothing samurai-like about it. There's also, of course, a logical fallacy involved in trying to deduce norms of actual behavior from formal legal and moral codes. Um, in fact, it's often argued that, that formal rules can be a, 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 are a good reverse barometer. The, the more often some uh, the law or uh, sermons, uh, you know, moral writers, uh, uh, educators argue for a subject, you must do this, you must do that, is a pretty good indication that, that it's because people are not doing that. Um, the truth is here, if you look at the actual historical records, selfless displays of loyalty by warriors are conspicuous in the Japanese historical record, mainly by their absence. From the beginnings of the, of the samurai and the Lord Va Vassal Bond in the eighth century to the onset of the early modern age, the ties between master and retainer were always contractual. They were based on mutual interests and mutual advantage. And they were always heavily conditioned by demands of self-interest. Medieval warriors were, and late classical warriors, were loyal to their lords only to the extent that it benefited them to be. They could and they did switch allegiances very easily when the situation called for it. In fact, there are almost no important battles in Japanese history, excuse me, in which the defection, sometimes in the middle of the fighting of one or more of the major players wasn't a big factor in, in, in the outcome. In fact, the standout feature of late classical warrior alliances, Heian period warrior alliances, was how fragile they were. Uh, this condition reflected the utterly amorphous nature of the Lord Vassal Bond during the period. Uh, unlike the uh, uh, land commendation arrangements and things like that that produced the estates show it, uh, alliances between warriors were simply not supported by written or other legal contracts. Formal arrangements uh, under which specified rewards or benefices were uh, offered in return for defined military services didn't develop until very late in samurai history. Uh, they did develop, but it, was, but it was a very, very late development. Before that, things were very, very fluid. Um, and the ability of warriors to manipulate any forms of carrot and stick in order to recruit or maintain or control followers was also in the early years of, of samurai history, the early centuries of samurai history, very closely circumscribed by their relatively weak political circumstances. Uh, even the most powerful warriors of the uh, uh, early medieval age occupied only intermediate positions in the socio-political hierarchy. Um, and they were always dependent on connections with the higher layers of the court, of court society, to maintain 
their political and economic positions. They had very limited autonomy in terms of governance and landholding, um, which meant that they lacked the right and therefore the means to reward or punish their followers directly. In uh, at least until the uh, uh, the 13th century, warriors remained primarily mercenaries. Their skills and services were offered in exchange for, sometimes for long-term patronage of their careers by high-ranking courtiers, uh, or else for more immediate short-term rewards. And allegiances, loyalties, were only as strong as the perceptions that the connection uh, worked to their advantage. Uh, Warrior allegiances were also circumscribed, limited by a very complex hierarchy uh, uh, in which uh, warriors were loyal to the guy above them, their immediate superior, but not necessarily to his superior. So you have buffer after buffer going from the, the, the lowest ranking warriors to the, the highest ranking figures in an army and such. Um, that uh, made it very difficult to think in very abstract terms. Ideological constraints were really not very useful either. Medieval war texts like the Heike, famous Heike Monogatari, Tale of the Heike, which supposedly describe events of the late Heian period are filled, of course, with uh, edifying tales attesting to fierce loyalty of warriors. But these are written much, much later. They're written about an earlier period and nobody pretends that that we uh, that the warrior audiences for these texts still behave that way. Um, the, uh, uh, or e even that maybe that the, the, the stories were real. Uh, earlier sources, contemporaneous sources like the Konjaku Monogatari that I uh, gave you a couple of stories from, uh, or Azuma Kagami, do give some hints that warriors were not completely oblivious to the idea of loyalty being a virtue. But they also make it very clear and more uh, objective sources make it very clear that the real effect of those sorts of ideas on samurai behavior was pretty minimal. For the most part, warriors viewed loyalty as a commodity, a commodity that was predicated on adequate remuneration uh, from the overlord. Uh, it was not an obligation that transcended self-interest. And consequently, hand military alliances tended to be uh, very short-lived and very fragile. And the larger the organization was, the more fleeting and more ephemeral it tended to be. Whoops. In the 14th century, um, expectations concerning commitments and, and loyalty uh, became closely bound up with distinctions between warriors of uh, various levels of, of autonomy. And these then hardened into hereditary social categories. Uh, so warriors of means became known as tozama, outsiders, or independents basically. Those who maintain strong dependent ties to more powerful local warriors were, became known as miuchi or insiders. Tozama were ideologically as well as economically autonomous. They chose their battles and their leaders according to very narrowly defined personal interests and circumstances of the moment. Um, And they were always more than ready to switch sides, desert to other employers uh, whenever that was became to their advantage, when they decided that would become to their advantage. Miyuchi, on the other hand, who lacked substantial uh, economic holdings of their own, uh, found themselves economically dependent on their lords and therefore were more easily forced to behave loyally. So um, the, the bonds between Tozama and their Miyuchi followers hinged very much on this disparity of resources and kept the vassals unable to challenge their lords. So Miyuchi were reliable in absolutely inverse proportion to their dependence on, on, their, uh, on their overlords. Those with 
very small holdings often displayed striking loyalty to, to, uh, to masters. Uh, but those who possessed extensive lands and followers of their own could and most often did condition their service and compel greater rewards. Now, of course, this was an inherently unstable relationship, which is really what explains the subsequent uh, 15th and 16th centuries, uh, because beyond a certain point, Miyuchi dependence and therefore Tozama control of their Miyuchi followers became nominal as a warrior's uh, organization became bigger, uh, the forces became bigger, uh, they, uh, and his power and size increased, his armed forces became less cohesive because his vassals are rising with him and also becoming landholders of means. Uh, and so eventually you reach the point where you have sufficient resources that you don't need to, uh, uh, you know, you're so close to, the, to, the, to your daimyo overlord, you can ignore him or move to someone else. Tozama loyalties to those above them were even more fluid and contingent. Uh, Miura uh, faithfulness was demanded uh, as an obligation born of dependency, but Tozama authority in military affairs was considered normal. It was normative. Tozama's res uh, uh, services had to be bought, had to be purchased. It was, there was no transcendent duty for a, a Tozama to participate on behalf of the court or the shogun or anyone else. Uh, responsibility for maintaining allegiance rested with the armies that sought to hire them, not with the warriors called. And so what you have here is an inverted uh, and mercenary ideological dynamic that kept large military organizations both unstable and reliant on central authority throughout the 14th century. But at the same time, the uh, competition for Tozama source, uh, services uh, whittled away at the very authority that manipulated, particularly because the 14th century, as some of, uh, many of you probably know, was the period in which there were two courts competing, and one in, the, in Kyoto and one south in Yoshino. And with, the, with two ostensible two set potential sources of authority, uh, Tozama basically always had a choice of customers. If I can't get what I want from the, uh, the Northern court, I can approach the Southern court or the other way around, or I could fight for one for a while and if I'm not getting in, I'm not satisfied, I can go approach the other side and still claim that I've got a legal edict and I've, I've observed all the niceties and, and the rules of, of uh, legalizing what I do and such. Um, so uh, with his choice of customers that, that always kept up the premise that military services had to be purchased from uh, rightfully autonomous contractors and made it impossible to simply demand them of obedient vassals, which is what had been possible uh, at least until the emergence of the Kamakura Shogun and, and really not uh, until the 14th century. Eventually, this led to central authority all but ceasing to exist except in name. The, uh, the famous, the result being the famous uh, uh, 16th, 15th and 16th century world of Gekoku Jō, the low overthrow the high, and Jakuniku Kyoshoku, the weak become meat, which the strong eat. Um, and the instability of all of that then, of course, led to the restructuring of daimyo rule that characterized the early modern period and the changes that we I talked about at the very beginning of the lecture. So, okay, I've, I've gone a little bit longer than I had expected I was going to here. But um, just to recap here, uh, samurai notions concerning honor and duty and loyalty were the main points I'm making here, were very complex. Uh, a lot of variation from era to era. Even in the early modern period, when the idea of a bushido, a, a code of conduct for samurai, a way to define proper samurai behavior, became the subject of written argument and, and, uh, uh, and lectures and such, there was tremendous disagreement as to the details. Uh, what does it really mean to be a, a, a good samurai? Samurai ideals concerning honor were also very different from Western ideals, both modern and medieval Western ideas. So 
I think the, the most important point here, you need to be very, very careful about reading or overlaying modern concepts of uh, and expectations onto samurai behavior. So I'm gonna leave it at that and uh, we can take questions. Well, first of all, I, I guess my my microphone is is having is, is echoing somewhere. <laughs> uh, professor, thank you very much for your very insightful presentation. I hope our Brazilian audience can uh, can learn a bit more about the reality of the, the samurai and not just the myth, right? And so we would like to thank you for your time here. And I would like to ask you if you would proceed, if you would prefer to proceed to the Q&A right now or have a five minute break. Um, it's up to you, either way is fine. All right, then we can proceed. Uh, just uh, I have just to make a quick announcement in Portuguese. Pessoal, já vou passar o link da chamada. Tá aí no chat. Uh, here in Brazil, we have to to fill this list of attendants to to get a, a certificate of attendance. <laughs> Uh, for the event and also so people get a bit anxious about that well I will use and abuse my my shogunal prerogatives to, to make the first question I would like to make you a question and it's exactly the same question I've made to to Professor Conlon, and in no way, shape, or form, I'm making the same question to discredit one <laughs> of you two at the side of the other or, or anything like that. I would just like to see how much uh, your perspectives may vary regarding this question and and also as an exercise to show everyone that even very senior scholars, very widely known, have different perspectives regarding certain subjects, or perhaps not. Let us see. So I will make the first question. Just, just let me uh, adjust the form here so I can read the questions more easily. So, I'm a researcher, a very junior researcher still, and, and I research samurai history as well, and medieval samurai history, more exactly, more precisely, uh, 13th to 14th century. And as per my understanding, the Bushi class, I'd rather call it the Bushi estate, perhaps, during the Japanese Middle Ages is much more nuanced and hard to pin down properly than it firstly would seem to be. Part of the problem to me is the myriad of other appellations related or not to their role as warriors that have been used through the centuries, such as Zaicho Kanjin, Roto, Wakashu, Yakusho, Myoshu, Tozama, Kokujin, Miyuchi, Miyuchi Bito, Gokenin, and even Samurai. Mm -hmm. Again, as per my understanding, some of those terms could or could not refer to members of the war class or our state. And its proper understanding relies heavily on context, although some terms seem to be more heavily associated with warriors in later centuries than they were 
for instance, during the Heian period, for instance, Hyakusho seem, and, and Miyushi seem to be a bit more related to wars later on than it was, uh, as per my understanding, in the, in the Heian period. Uh, having said that, I would like to ask how one can confidently carry out his research when facing this myriad of terms, because I strongly believe the Bushi estate itself was, to a degree, undefinable. Nonetheless, we see authors such as Yoshida Kenko in his Tsude Zuregusa making statements that clearly show that at least from the outside, the Bushi were very much defined. How open or closed, defined or undefined, would you say the warrior society proper was during the Kamakura, Muromachi, and Sengoku periods? Could we call the members of the base, such as the Miuchi, Bushi? Could we call the warrior elite of the Shugo Bushi as well? Okay, yeah, <laughs> that's a very big question. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, as you said, you know, a, a lot of terms there, and the majority of those, of course, don't directly relate to warriors per se. They're, they're terms that relate to economic statuses or, or uh, government uh, positions, things like that, uh, positions relative to a piece of land, and that sort of thing. But I think, you know, the, one of the, the most important uh, and most basic things that, that uh, to understand about uh, uh, samurai history or warrior history is that, that uh, the idea of a warrior class, which is something that gets tossed around all the time. Um, you know, I see this in textbooks and, and certainly when you're in, in uh, uh, popular sorts of, of histories, people talk about the warrior class and, and back, but it didn't exist until the uh, the Tokugawa period. It's an early modern invention. The, uh, uh, before that, being a warrior was vocational, uh, and you could slide in and out of, of, uh, of being a warrior. And in fact, most of these jobs uh, or positions that we're talking about, you know, the uh, Myoshu and, and that sort of thing in the early period, you didn't necessarily have to be a warrior. It wasn't really until... Uh, the late Kamakura period that these provincial elites that were the heads of estates and such, that you would find a majority of them were in fact militarized, warriors by our modern definition. This is one of the reasons I, when, uh, you know, I, I did in uh, at least one of my books use the term samurai uh, to describe early warriors, but uh, I've since decided that was a mistake. The, uh, uh, I used it and explained it and I've explained it to when colleagues have asked me about it, the idea that samurai is basically an English word at this point uh, for a, a meaning Japanese warrior. It's a generic term, and so it's familiar to people. And I don't think that's wrong, but I think that it's probably not as helpful as it could be. So uh, since then, I've gone back to just calling them warriors or uh, the Japanese term bushi, so to avoid repeating it. But there are all sorts of terms and uh, these landholders were not, some landholders early on became militarized, others didn't. There are militarized people, warriors at all levels of the socio-political hierarchy, except the very, very top, but all the way from people who are basically just uh, fairly well-off peasants all the way up to uh, the middle, at least the middle tiers of the court hierarchy. And in some cases, some very dramatic cases, toward the end of the Heian period, for example, you have someone like Taita Kiyomori, who is actually able to jump out of that middle tier of, of the court hierarchy and, and into the very top. Um, it's a very complicated concept that uh, uh, at any period you look at as to you know whether there is such a thing as being a warrior. Certainly, there's already by the hand period some, some sense among these people that, that a guy that, that's a fighting man 
who's a little more than a peasant, has something in common with these guys who are really central court aristocrats sent out as provincial governors and are also warriors. And of course, the governors are playing on that. You know, why would you work for me instead of that, my rival? Because I'm a warrior like you. You know, I, I, we've both been in battles. We have something in common. And outsiders clearly have some sense of there is such a thing as a warrior. But, you know, it, uh, the real self identity was, uh, at least in, uh, during the Heian period, was much more economic circumstances and social level that, that you're in, in in the social hierarchy. Uh, warriors identified with their non-warrior peers much more than they did with people who were warriors above them or below them in the hierarchy. I, the, one of the analogies I like here is to think in terms of a modern company. If you're a guy that, uh, you know, a blue collar worker in a company that makes automobiles, cars, you I have some sense that, yeah, I have something in common with the executives and the president of, of, of the company. I mean, we all work for Toyota. Uh, there's some sense of that. And outsiders have some sense of, yes, you're both Toyota employees, but really, you know, who are you going to go out drinking with? Who do you think of, of people like you? You're thinking not of the, the, the CEO of Toyota. You're, you have much more in common with people who work on the, uh, uh, you know, work in the factories, other blue collar workers in uh, companies that make television sets or, you know, electronics, computers, whatever. And at the other end, same thing, right? If you're a, a CEO, your peers are CEOs in other industries, not guys who junior executives in your own company or junior executives in uh, uh, in the who work in the factories, and really not so much more. You know, the, 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 you, you don't really think of yourself as having so much more in common with with if you're the CEO of Toyota with the CEO of say uh, uh, General Motors than you do with the. Uh, the CEO of Sony, or something like that. So yeah, it's it's social status. The idea that there's something in common is there, but it's not very strong. It begins to get a little stronger. You begin to develop a sense of of yes, there's something such a thing as a warrior as warrior identity that that transcends social levels just barely in the early Kamakura period. And this is, and, and even then it's less warriors per se than a particular class of warriors, the Gokaini, the direct retainers of, of the Kamakura shogunate. And this is because the shogunate beginning with Yoritomo himself and, and continued by his, his successors sought to make these people a special class. And by the end of the period, the term no longer even has anything in relationship to the shogun, and it is simply uh, elite warriors get to call themselves Gokaini, even if they've never been connected to the shogun. Um, and then again, as I mentioned in the talk, you know, as you get into the 14th century, you start to develop terms like Tozama and Miyuchi that, that represent the relationships and, and status levels within the warrior class and such. But still very much throughout the, uh, uh, the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, uh, being there are families, of course, particularly families relatively high up in the hierarchy that generation after generation after generation are warriors. And that's true all the way back to the Heian period. Uh, but also the ability to move in and out of those, uh, of, of you know, being a warrior is ultimately a decision. It's a vocational decision. It's a decision to pick up weapons and go fight on a battlefield. Uh, and, you know, the most dramatic example of that is Toyo Tomi Hideyoshi, who starts out as a peasant and gets recruited as a foot soldier. His original job, according to some accounts, was sandal bearer. This is a guy who runs along beside the, 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 the general and carries his shoes for him and gets a chance to actually fight, shows he has some ability, he gets promoted to be a junior officer and a senior officer and ends up becoming uh, 
Oda Nobunaga's most important general and then taking over after Nobunaga dies and is briefly essentially king of Japan. Uh, uh, is the, the one that unites all of Japan and then passes that on, not intentionally, but uh, he's, uh, because he didn't provide for his own succession very well under the Tokugawa regime that, that followed him. So, you know, you can go from nothing to, to the top. The whole medieval period is a hallmark of, of social mobility. You know, that's one of the, or that rather, that's the hallmark of the, one of the hallmarks of the medieval period that you can move, you can be anything you want to be if you have the talent and you work hard enough at it. And this is one of the major reactions of the early modern regime, beginning with Hideyoshi himself and then followed by the first, especially the first three Tokugawa shoguns who said, this creates tremendous instability. So let's lock the door. We're going to freeze social status. And it's from now on, uh, we've got basically the four orders, uh, uh, but in fact, really more than that, really more like three orders. And it's much more complicated than that. But we've got uh, townsmen, uh, peasants, and warriors. And these are separate groups. And, and you're born into one or the other, and you don't get to move. You can move within them in those orders or, or castes or, or estates, but you, you're really not supposed to move from one to the other, except under very special circumstances. You could be declared to have samurai status as a reward for some kind of wonderful service as a merchant or a peasant or something. But in any case, at that point, then it becomes a hereditary thing. And you can, for the first time, talk about a warrior class or a samurai class, but not before that. In terms for uh, warriors before that, very much, you know, our, our generic bushi is the most, one of the most common, or musha, uh, tsuamono. Uh, they all just mean fighting men, and they, they're applied to people at all different levels here, but they just mean someone that fights. Um, the term samurai, as, again, uh, I think you can make the argument that it's become, it's come into English. You'll find it in most English dictionaries. Uh, and so it means it's a generic English word. As an English word, it means Japanese warrior, but it doesn't in Japanese. The original term, it, be, it comes from the, the verb Samurao or saburao, meaning to serve. And it originally basically referred to uh, people who, uh, who had court rank, but were also retainers of higher ranking uh, courtiers. So uh, relatively high ranking uh, people who had overlords, personal lords. And by the end of the Heian period, one of one important group amongst these people called samurai were, of course, people who were doing military service for the Fujiwara regents and for the uh, retired emperors and for other important courthouses. And so that by the um, by the end of the period, those are the groups. It's these military servants who are most commonly being called samurai. But you would not have used samurai to describe anybody out in the provinces. The, the people who made up these armies. It's only this, this top level of, of, of warrior. Um, and it's only during the Tokugawa period. And I don't, to be honest with you, uh, off the top of my head, I can't give you the specifics of exactly how this comes about, but only in the Tokugawa period do rank and file warriors begin to be identified as samurai. And then using that term, you know, you're all samurai. And this is of course part of the, because the Tokugawa regime is trying to say, no, we're all a group. But in fact, they're not a group. This is why uh, class is a, is a dangerous word to use. There's a huge difference between a daimyo and an ordinary run of the, of the mill warrior. Uh, class, of course, is, a, is a, mainly a, an economic construct. And, and you're talking about the difference between uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and, and me, you know, <laughs> or the guy that, that uh, uh, mows the grass in, my, uh, in, in the apartment that I live in. Um, you know, the, uh, there's no relationship there at all um, in terms of class. You know, even if you work for, uh, could be working for the same company, the guy that, that uh, puts stuff in the boxes in, in, at Amazon is not <laughs> Jeff Bezos. And yeah, we're Amazon employees. So, and so we're all, all Amazonians maybe, but not really. You know, nobody thinks of themselves that way. But the Tokugawa regime tried to pretend that that's the case. 
know, it's not a class. Anyway, that's a very long answer, but. No, that, that was, that was very, your answer was, was great and was very close to Professor Collins' answer and, and perspective as well. And it will help me a lot in my <laughs> master thesis. So <laughs> that's good. Uh, but following on that, uh, well, if we take the the Gunk Monogatari tradition, we see that there is an effort to sometimes separate warriors from non-warriors. Mm -hmm. in the literature right mm -hmm. and how how would you cons reconcile that with the the material reality well the... I, yeah you know there really is clearly even back in the hand period some sense of, of professionalism here and, and uh, hereditary occupations and that sort of thing um, you find some very interesting references in, in Honjaku Monogatari was a, is a very interesting text for this. It has lots of references to warrior behavior and warriors, war stories. Um, and there are several very good anecdotes that uh, talk about so-and-so doing something who was a great fighter, a great warrior, even though he was not of a warrior house. So that idea was there, but it's not, that's not an idea unique to, to warriorness. Um, hereditary occupational occupations was a fact of of uh, of uh, uh, or of the Heian society uh, among court families. Right, the uh, uh, the idea that even though these were appointed jobs, but it tended to be the case that that families tended to get the same sequence of jobs over and over and over again, generation after generation. So you begin ultimately to identify a lot of those occupations and posts with particular families. The most dramatic example of that being the Fujiwara house, that the regent's house, that the only family that could hold that title of shogun or, re, or a, a imperial regent. Um, so there, it's not, again, it's not true that there's absolutely no idea that warriors constitute a separate group. There is, and there's some sense of, yeah, I have an identity as a warrior, but it's not, at least until you get into the medieval, well into the medieval period, it's not overriding. It, uh, it, it's your social peers. By the medieval period, of course, most of these, the, the areas of, of, of society in which, uh, you know, levels of society in which warriors were, were active, warriors were dominant. You know, by the end of the Kamakura period, most major landholders were militarized, but it's not, that wasn't true during the, the at the beginning of the Kamakura period. Uh, probably 50% of Shoan managers, maybe even less, were militarized, were, you know, armed and, 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 and participated in, in, in wars. All of them, almost all of them, of course, used troops in a military force one way or another. They, they, uh, would contract for it, but a lot of them were not armed themselves. Uh, as, as things begin to evolve, then you see local society, provincial society, becoming more and more uh, armed and and, uh, and and dominated by, by warriors. So that association grows. Um, but again, even then, you know, especially at the bottom, it's easy to come in and out, and people are doing it all the time. My my mic was muted. I was I, I muted myself. Sorry. Thank you very much for for your your answer and just a quick announcement in Portuguese. Um, tem uma pergunta que eu recebi aqui da Elizabeth da Silva Mendonça. A pergunta veio em branco, Elizabeth. Se você quiser reenviar no formulário. Eu repasso aqui daí conforme ela aparecer. Well, back to the questions then. Now okay. I will stop monopolizing the 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 lecture. <laughs> <laughs>
our, our illustrious guest. Now, here comes a question from Lucas Marques Villena Mota. Good evening, Professor Friday. I would like to know your opinion about the representations and... So, sorry, it's in Portuguese, so I'll try my best to translate it uh, like on the go. I would like to, to know your opinion uh, regarding the representations and the imaginary the West builds uh, concerning the samurai. Recently, we've had uh, an electronic video game called Ghost of Tsushima <laughs> that, beyond being a huge success commercially, re-solidifies uh, a certain type of construction of, of, I guess, a construct of what a samurai would be, maybe. Um, well, yeah, there's a lot of variety there, right? Um, some of, some movies, and, and, and parts of movies and things are not too bad. Uh, for the most part, really not great. Um, even Japanese movies, but, uh, you know, some of them are, are quite useful. I like to use movies in my classes and things, uh, but you have to be very, very careful and selective. And, you know, most Western, uh, the stuff that shows up in video games and, uh, 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 in movies and TV shows and such, uh, some of it's again. They're usually bits and pieces that are that are accurate. They tend to be pretty good most of the time uh, with physical stuff, you know, costumes and things like that. But uh, often terrible at uh, uh, real circumstances. You know, the the uh, uh, movie uh, Last Samurai. The Tom Cruise movie is a very good example of that. The, uh, um, he's got the costumes really, really well. The sets and things are very, very good. But the uh, uh, the Japan that they're portraying there is is, is ludicrous. Uh, the samurai uh, that show up in the uh, in that movie were nothing like what uh, uh, warriors were. Uh, uh, by the, uh, the late 19th century like this. And of course, the whole idea of, of, of uh, uh, an American become, uh, going over and, and being hired, first of all, an American being hired as a, as a military consultant in Japan in the 19th century would never have happened. That's a Hollywood conceit. The uh, 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 Japanese did hire a lot of foreign military contractors, of course, Westerners, but they were Europeans. Americans were barbaric <laughs> and <laughs> uncivilized and, uh, and barely had a, an army worth even thinking about as far as, as uh, most of the world was concerned. Um, it simply would not have happened. Uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it would be the modern equivalent of, of Putin hiring, I don't know. I actually know. I don't, let's not get into specifics because uh, <laughs> I'm going to step on somebody's toes if I uh, mention any any small country. But uh, but in any case, uh, no, you know th th that wouldn't have happened. And and the the samurai that you see there, you know the uh, the Ken, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, not Takakura Ken. Uh, forgot anyway. Um, The, the main samurai character there, the one that, that's the, the, the Saigo Takamori character, is a landed warrior often in this ancestral village. And there weren't warriors like that anymore by the, by the 19th century. They were uh, all samurai, were stipended retainers living in castle towns, or almost all samurai. Uh, the, uh, uh, the big clash of, of uh, uh, samurai in traditional armor armed with swords running out onto the battlefield against imperial troops with guns. That did not happen. You know, the, uh, uh, in in the, the real incident that inspired this, the uh, uh, Saigo Takamori story, his troops were armed with modern weapons and things too. And they did tend to uh, uh, use somewhat more traditional tactics. So they just didn't, but they didn't have as much 
uh, modern armament and such. And they were so dramatically outnumbered that, that they, uh, they lost that fight. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you know, they, uh, I, I would say that most of what you see in, in video games and things like that, uh, I mean, I, I, it's hard to talk generically here, but uh, mostly it's not very good. You know, there are sometimes bits and pieces that, that, that are pretty accurate and, and a whole lot of, of just total nonsense and fantasy. All right. Thank you again. Uh, I guess that will satisfy Lucas' curiosity. Now to the next question. Uh, we have a question here from Rafael de Mesquita GL. Sorry if I mispronounced your last surname. So, Rafael asks, in some movies and illustrations, we saw a young servant, the movies translate as page boy, who carries the daimyo's sword. May you talk more about their origin, background, and status in samurai society? Did they start to appear in Sengoku or Ido Tokugawa period? Um, yeah, I'm sure, you know, you, you, uh, probably older than that, you know, you're going to have servants that, uh, uh, you know, personal servants. Um, and swords become an important symbolic weapon fairly early in Japanese history. Um, the, uh, uh, that predates the samurai, actually, but it, but, it, but it becomes a very, very important symbolic weapon. Uh, for much of, of uh, uh, samurai history. And of course, that idea is really built up as you move into the Tokugawa period. A uh, famous line about the sword is the soul of the samurai, in part because that was one of the visible badges of, of, of status, right? Samurai were required to wear two swords only, and, uh, and nobody else could do that. Uh, also, uh, I think, a lot of it has to do with the fact that, that that's the weapon you're carrying around with you all the time. So it's the one they tend to be familiar with and, and uh, spend most of their time training with. Because the same reason that, that modern people who do uh, study martial arts tend more often than not to study unarmed fighting arts, you know, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu <laughs> in Brazil uh, or uh, Karate, Judo, Aikido, whatever. Because if you're going to do martial arts, the, all of the general physical and spiritual benefits that are supposed to go with that, of course, can come from anything. But if you're going to do study something, why not study something practical? I mean, you know, it doesn't do me much good to be really, really good with a bow and arrow because that's no, that's useless for self-defense. So I might just as well uh, learn unarmed fighting stuff, and then maybe I can protect myself in a street fight or a bar fight or something. Um, so yeah. Um, but the uh, uh, so sword, you know, someone to, a, a page that, that carries around the, the daimyo sword is a very important position. Um, the uh, uh, that would most likely have been a young relative, but not necessarily. It might have been a young relative of, of a high-ranking retainer or something like that. I think that goes probably back again, you know, predating the samurai. So I'm sure it was always there. I can't really tell you a whole lot of details about that. There, there. The, uh, Japanese warriors didn't really have, uh, at least not to my knowledge, the kind of uh, formalized uh, apprenticeship program that you see in Europe, you know, where you become a, a, a page and then a squire and then a, and a knight. And there's no formal institution of knighthood, uh, at least. Yeah, well, not none really, right? Because you're, you're uh, during the Tokugawa period, you're part of a, of a samurai order, but you're born into that. And, it's true that, you know, European knights, you're born to become a knight, but you're still not a knight until you have a formal ceremony that says now you've been knighted. And there's nothing like that. There's a, there are coming of age ceremonies and things like that, but not, uh, not the same sort of thing that moves you from being just a fighting man to a special kind of fighting man. I'm not sure if I answered, if I'm answering that question or not. <laughs> I suppose so. I mean, it seems a bit of a 
I, I may be interpreting it all wrong, but it seems like a continuation of aristocratic servants, right? And, and mm. attendants and all of that stuff. Except that he would carry a sword, but I don't know, maybe a, a servant of a Fujiwara nobu could carry a sword as well. Yeah, I mean, there are certain circumstances under which they would. And, uh, and you probably have someone that carries a sword around for him under for certain kinds of ceremonies and things. Um, there are swords that are given as uh, symbols of, of office when you're appointed to something, to a, a job, you know, uh, uh, expect particularly a military commission in the early, during the hand period, for example. And you handed a sword as, as, as symbolic and samurai continue to do that. You see that even in movies, um, you know, where somebody says, I appoint you in charge of this castle and, and the way you symbolize that is you give him a sword um not one that he's ever going to use for real it's just it's you know it's it's symbolic I mean, again you see that in, in, in like you do in, in in western warfare you know until uh, uh at least fairly recently you know that was the formal way to surrender you hand over your ceremonial saber right uh, that was at least as late as the 19th century, and I think beyond that, you, you know, you, you can surrender that way. You, you remove your sword and present it to the winner and say, you know, I think it's probably a kind of symbolic way of saying I'm at your mercy. By the way, by the way, the, the person who asked the question, Rafael, just thank you for for your your answer. So. That one was completely covered. No, <laughs> no words okay. about that. Now a question by Gabriel Silvestre Ferraz. Mm -hmm. Professor Friday, do you think that the classic on quotes samurai mentality like the Bushido is something that persists on the contemporary Japan or is it something limited to conservative groups? I don't know if I if I understood this question correctly, but yeah, I guess it depends on what you mean by persist. Um, I mean, certainly the idea of um, you know of bushido and 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 that the, these are Japanese values and that sort of thing, which is an idea that that's developed during the Meiji period and expanded on in the pre-war period uh, and then comes back in the post-war period, um, that's around. Um, but I don't, I think that's mainly a right-wing idea. I, uh, dealing, you know, I, I mean, it's not something that I've studied systematically. Uh, I don't do 20th century history, but uh, certainly my experience, and I've been, I've been living in Japan on, off and on for 40 some years now, uh, coming up on 45, actually. Uh, the uh, uh, Most Japanese kind of roll their eyes when you start talking about things like Bushido uh, and uh, or ninja for that matter, <laughs> it's, you know, samurai uh, stuff. The, uh, the Most of my acquaintances would be somewhat embarrassed by the idea that all Japanese are warriors and, and such. Um, one of the strangest things, of course, about connecting these is that the whole idea of Bushido as, as developed during the Tokugawa period, it was a, meant to set warriors apart from the other classes. And then the, the, when, the, when you get the late 19th and 20th century version of this that says this is Japanese, it's generically Japanese, all Japanese are, are the inheritors of this uh, tradition would have been uh, uh, sacrilegious to somebody like Yamaga Soko, you know, of course not. No, peasants can't be, I don't know Bushido. They don't behave with Bushido. It's not part of everybody's soul. It's what makes me better than you. Um, so uh, it's there, but uh, it's certainly become a popular trope for the right wing. It's, 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 it's popular. The idea that, that Bushido is, is uh, uh, we're all, Heirs to Bushido is popular in some martial arts groups. Some of them, a lot of them right wing, some of them maybe not so right wing. Um, but 
I don't think it's yeah, it, 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 so in that sense, yes, it's it's around, but uh, is it something that that uh, most Japanese would would uh, think of? You know, that, uh, on any kind of conscious or unconscious level, I, I don't think so. I, I really don't. But again, I, I have not really done any kind of systematic study on on, on that. Right, uh, I guess I guess that answers the question because I'm a bit confused uh, about what the question was exactly, but I think it was on those very same lines. Yeah, now, you know, um, just one other point that just occurred to me here that that, that uh, one of the more interesting things about. I, I briefly mentioned the the phenomenon in, in the 80s and, and uh, into the early 90s of Japanese business running on Bushido. You know, there were there's a wonderful translation of, of uh, uh, Miyamoto Musashi's uh, Kodin no Sho that has a picture of a uh, uh, an American businessman or Western businessman fighting off a samurai with using his briefcase. And you know, the whole theme is, is that, that uh, you know, Bushido was the essence of, of uh, Japanese business, tech, business tactics and things. Um, most Japanese would find, at the time, found that really, really funny. And, and it, one of the interesting things is that, that about that is Godi no Sho was a very obscure text. It's one of the reasons that, you know, that it had been translated in Japan translation services tried to retranslate it and couldn't sell it. So then somebody came up with the idea of putting the guy with the briefcase on the front and adding an introduction saying, this is how Japanese business works. Uh, but uh, as that, and then that became a bestseller. Everybody on Wall Street was reading it. And then all of a sudden, uh, Japanese, modern Japanese translations of this, what was a very, very difficult and very obscure mar book on martial arts, suddenly, it became a best modern tra Japanese translations also became bestsellers in Japan because Japanese are reading it to find out what Western business people are reading about what we're doing. You know, they're, they're studying Godin no Show in order to find out what, what their uh, French and American and Brazilian counterparts expect them to do. So we know what the, what strategy they think we're going to follow or at least hoping to find ideas like that. So it's a, yeah, a very interesting kind of snowball. That, that kind of, of appropriation gets me so mad. Like here in Brazil as well, we have uh, Godino Show translated to Portuguese with the mm -hmm. preface uh, talking about business, how you can apply mm -hmm. Miyamoto, Musashi, Miyamoto Musashi's ideals to, to, to business practices and it is ludicrous to me. I, I find that so so infuriating. <laughs> the way it was yes. put there, especially. And well, I know. There's a whole series of that. Well. that there's a, an author named uh, uh, Eric von Lusbaden that, that uh, did a whole series of, of novels that were popular back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s um, that dealt with ninja and things like that. But, you know, he was constantly talking about uh, 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 at least one of them. He has Japanese bureaucrats that, that now are followers of something he calls uh, Kandyodo, the way of the bureaucrat, which is just a modern version of Bushido. That, and, and, oh, come on, nobody uses that word. And uh, he, he liked to throw on the word harage, which is a kind of gut instinct, literally, you know, the art of the belly, but it, you know, it, it's used in real Japanese to talk about things, you know, your sense of being able to feel what, what someone you're talking to is actually thinking. And the way we do, everybody does this in conversation. You know, you're, you're about to say something and really, now, if I say it that way, it'll probably offend him. You're picking up clues from body language. And that's what Hadege generally means. But, you know, uh, Luce Baden was using it for uh, uh, and some kind of mysterious martial arts technique where you can read the opponent's mind or, you know, anticipate him and things, all sorts of things like that, you know, that, 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 that pop up. And uh, uh, of course, Japanese would find that all of that stuff ludicrous. Uh, you've left uh, a very interesting hook uh, 
when you've cited that Gori no Show was a very obscure text, I would like to to comment on that asking very briefly, uh, because when most of the people that don't study samurai uh, then to think about uh, the, the best example of the samurai as Miyamoto Musashi, for instance. Mm -hmm. uh, how widely known was he really, historically speaking? Because to me, it seems that most of his fame comes from Eiji Yoshikawa's mm -hmm. novel, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, I doubt that, that uh, uh, anybody but a handful of martial arts people probably uh, had any idea who uh, Musashi was until the, uh, uh, Yoshikawa. It was originally a series of newspaper articles when it was collected into a novel. But yeah, that's where that, those stories come from. He becomes a big, well-known hero because of that. And 90% of, of what everybody thinks they know about the historical Musashi is, is stuff that, that Yoshikawa basically made up or you know gathered stories. There had to have been stories uh, around. And again, I'm, I'm not a Musashi expert, but um, the uh, uh, Godino show is, is real. He actually wrote it down. There really was a, a Miyamoto Musashi who can trace some bits and pieces of his history. Uh, but uh, you know he didn't become the samurai and, until uh, the, the Yoshikawa novels became popular. And then, of course, they've been turned into movies many, many times and TV series and, and things like that and other modern novels about him. And Godin no Show's popularity, I think, basically comes from that. The, uh, um, it's because of the novels. But even that, you know, the, the, uh, certainly by the, uh, by the 1980s, when this whole phenomenon broke the uh, uh nobody was paying a lot of attention to a text like Godin no show certainly nobody's reading it in the original because it's a very difficult version of, of 16th century or 17th century japanese but even modern japanese translations of it uh, selling hundreds of copies a year countrywide and all of a sudden then you're selling uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of copies because the wall street journal does an article saying this is what's uh, uh, Japanese business people think. Right. <laughs> that that turned out to be a, a, a plot twist, I'd say. <laughs> so we have here another question from Rafael de Mesquita Diel. Uh, Rafael asks, some samurai movies point a difference between the most sober restrained samurai and the nobles of the imperial court like more luxurious people wearing more ceremonial robes and mm -hmm. exaggerated makeup is it a historical reality or an image produced in later periods uh, a little of both. You know, uh, one of the really interesting problems you have when you're doing a movie is, is uh, how to uh, uh, you know, do things like makeup. Um, the, uh, uh, because if, if, if being historically accurate, sometimes you, you put somebody in, in genuinely accurate historical costumes, especially cosmetics, makeup, face makeup and haircuts and things like that, um, give a very different impression to modern audiences than they would have to contemporaries. Um, I see that a lot. You know, the, uh, I, when I use movies for classes, I, I like to point that out to students, so the, dealing with the, the hand period, for example. The, uh, uh, one of the really interesting things that directors seem to do a lot is that they uh, uh, will often have uh, courtiers that you're not supposed to like, male courtiers you're not supposed to like, and sometimes female courtiers as well, actually wearing relatively authentic makeup. But the ones you're supposed to like, that are supposed to be heroic, or the women that are supposed to be beautiful, 
are made up to look more like modern women. Uh, and that's because it's very difficult to say, you know, this is the most beautiful woman in the world uh, and sell that to a modern audience when she's got her eyebrows plucked in a couple of little spots and her face is chalk white and a little tiny uh, lips painted in and, and that sort of thing. It doesn't, it isn't attractive and teeth blackened. Uh, and the same thing is true of men. If, if, if the, the hero is supposed to be heroic, he doesn't look heroic. He looks very effeminate and, and, uh, and very off-putting to have the blackened teeth and the chalk white face and, and such. Um, but, you know, that's, that's the reality. And court makeup and, and costuming and things continues. But it's also true that the high-ranking samurai often imitated that. Uh, many, uh, and you're seeing that sometimes actually in some more recent uh, movies and, and TV series, they sometimes do have at least some of the samurai, the ranking samurai characters are also wearing court makeup because that individual is known for it. Um, for court ceremonies and things, you would have seen uh, and, and, and some kinds of, of very formal shogunal ceremonies and things, the sort of thing that uh, was you know, the, the backdrop to the, uh, the, the Chushingura uh, 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 Ronin story, Ako Ronin story, uh, where you've got imperial envoys coming to the court. Chances are that Asano would have been probably wearing court makeup and a court costume for, for that ceremony, but possibly not, because by then, Samurai also begin in the later medieval period and into the early modern period to develop their own formalized etiquette that does separate them from the court, because that was important too for the shogun, to uh, the shogunate, really, the, the government, to uh, draw a distinction between courtiers and, 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 uh, and the warrior order. They're supposed to be separate things. So, yeah, I mean, uh, some of it is real and some of it is exaggerated. And, and a lot of it is, is uh, what you see in the movies is done with an idea of, of what effect portraying the character this way, making him look this way, is going to have on modern audiences. Uh, characters that, that are, again, characters that are supposed to be light tend not to be put in, in blackened teeth and, and chalk white face and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, the the uh, female characters that you're supposed to dislike and they're treacherous and they're the rival of the of the heroine are made up more traditionally. And the same thing with, with the male characters, you know, that uh, you often, the, the directors like to draw that distinction. It's a very difficult thing. It's kind of a translation issue in many ways. You know, uh, when you're translating words, do you translate something how do you translate this phrase to something else? Do you want to give uh, uh, the same impression, especially if you're translating old things, for example, you know, translating uh, a, a book written in the uh, 19th century, do you want to make it sound very close to the way that, uh, let's say we're translating from, from Japanese to English, you know, the way that a 19th century or 18th century Japanese would have read that, or do you want to make it, uh, and so you translate it into something that's rather contemporaneous English, or do you want to make it translated into a, into a phrasing that reproduces the feeling that a modern Japanese has reading that 18th century of uh, uh, Japanese? Uh, you know, so you translate it into something that's Shakespearean or whatever. It's the same sort of problem, ultimately. You know, one is visual and one is linguistic, but it's really the same issue. That was extremely insightful. And I, I, I get actually quite frightened by those black and <laughs> teeth. I, yeah. find that, that, I find that very hard to look at. Well, you know, it's interesting because it's the exact opposite of modern aesthetics. The uh, uh, particularly really modern aesthetics, and it's, it's not unusual in uh, especially uh, um, northern uh, societies, you know, where you don't get a lot of sunshine, to uh, uh, associate light complexions with higher status for the obvious reason that you're not outside, right? If you're a farmer, you're working out in the sun and you get suntanned, even when you're talking about light skin, and I think that's probably 
where a lot of, of uh, uh, racial prejudices get tied into, it, uh, they sort of merge with that. Um, but also, you know, in, in uh, particularly in the, in the contemporary, as you move into the, the 70s, 80s, 90s, the, the, the 21st century, um, maybe reversing itself now because people are concerned about skin cancer, but, you know, having a tan is a, uh, is a high aesthetic because it, 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 it's not associated with, you don't acquire a tan from working, you acquire a tan because you can play tennis or golf or, uh, you know, you have leisure. So it's a high status thing. And you have this aesthetic that says that, that it's very, very attractive to have shiny white teeth and a healthy, colorful complexion. Uh, the Japanese had the exact opposite. You know, it's that same contrast, but it's the opposite. It's, it's chalk white skin contrasted with blackened teeth, which I think among other things gives you a very good idea of just how artificial aesthetics of beauty always are in any society. There's a, you may have come across this before, but uh, it's very famous. There's a, uh, one of the most interesting little bits of, of Heian period literature is a, a short story it's uh, Battle Keen translated as the, uh, like the title is the, the, the Lady Who Loved Insects. Um, but the, the, this uh, uh, young court woman from a high ranking family that, that uh, is uh, a real problem for her family and for all of her peers because she refuses to uh, uh, follow accepted aesthetics. She likes to play with bugs and, and rats and things like that too, which makes her weird. But, uh, but among other things, she, she won't whiten her skin. She won't pluck her eyebrows. She doesn't blacken her teeth. And, and people are constantly complaining about that. She's so creepy. Those shiny white awful. She smiles and it makes me sick. Those white teeth, <gasps> you know, and, and uh, uh, the, the god awful things on her forehead. It looks like she's got caterpillars crawling across her face because she won't pluck out the eyebrows and, and paint them in. And whereas, of course, for Modern audience, you look at that, and that the plucked eyebrows and, and, and such looks horrible, and the, and the blackened teeth looks horrible. Is this is this, is this story from the Konjaku Monogatari issue or, or any collection uh, like that? Or yeah, I think it, I don't think it's from Konjak. I think it's from something else, but I I, I don't remember right off the top of my head. I, I should know that actually. I should I, I use that incident. Or that anecdote all the time. I've, I've got curious right now about that. Now I have a question from Nakita Trisan. I I hope to not have butchered her surname as well. Uh, Nakita, eu não sei se eu entendi bem tua questão. Eu vou tentar interpretar ela da melhor maneira possível. Se eu tiver errado, tu corrige aqui no chat. Tudo bem? So it's in English, uh, but I'm not I'm not getting exactly the point here. I mean, I'm. Let us see. First of all, good evening, Professor Friday. Thank you for the amazing lecture. Did Hideyoshi's sword addict had an impact in separating the bushy class from the land? Or was this already happening mainly due to the daimyo's military needs and then the edict ended up being for disarming peasants specifically? Uh, uh, now that I've read it uh, slowly, I, I think I got it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, <laughs> with both. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, people kind of forget sometimes when you're talking about this transition from medieval to early modern is that a great deal, the vast majority of what Hideyoshi did and, and what was picked up on by the, the Tokugawa regime uh, wasn't invented there. They're just simply pick, taking the best ideas from daimyo all over the country. You have this problem that's been evolving over the course of Japanese history, where basically you go back to the, the, the uh, Heian period, you have a very stable society where a social order that's very locked in and such and everything uh, coming from the center. And then uh, Minamoto Yoritomo interrupts that by uh, uh, basically saying, 
uh, the role that the court plays here in uh, guaranteeing rights over land and things like that. It's very important because we don't want anarchy, but you know, it doesn't have to be the court. All you need is a piece of paper. And if you believe that, that the piece of paper I give you is just as good, it is just as good, which is a really fascinating to me. Uh, uh, what perception or, or a, a understanding of exactly what authority really means. It's something I like to lecture about. I won't get into that in any great detail. But, you know, of course, the consequence for that is that uh, Yoritomo does it and people say, yeah, it works. And in fact, enough people decided that, that, that yeah, that's, that works for me. I, 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 I'm a, a certificate from Yoritomo is good enough, not for the court, but it's a short step from there to all of his other warriors saying, well, why does it have to come from Yoritomo or from the, the shogun? Then why not me? You know, the, uh, 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 just because he thought of it, it's the, the same issue. Once you've stepped, broken out of the mold that says that, that everything has to come from, ultimately from the imperial, the person or the emperor and, and filter down, then, okay, well, why does it have to be you and can't me? And, and so things break down. And over the course of the next several centuries, you have a complete breakdown of the power of formal authority. You know, it's always important to, to in Japanese history to distinguish power and authority. It's one of the cliches, but but it's important because the uh, uh, authority being the right to do something and power being the ability to do something. And in Japan, those are almost always separate. And the ability of authority to, to generate power begins to break down until by the time you get to the 16th century, of course, it's a disaster. It's not really as bad as the impression you get, I think, from most general histories. You know, the, the authority of the court was still, you know, a lot of the work of the last 20 years in particular has, has emphasized that the court was still a big player here. But still, you have the famous idea of, you know, Jakuniku Kyoshoku and, and Gekoku Jo, where uh, the ability to, you know, what makes you a daimyo the ability to get a lot of people to say you're a daimyo and, and take your orders. And, and what happens? Well, if, if they decide they don't want to, they break with you and, and, and attack you or sell their services to someone else. This tremendous instability was really what Hideyoshi and the Tokugawas were trying to undo. And so what they're, uh, and, but they weren't the first to do that. You know, the, what, what makes Hideyoshi possible is that the daimyo all over the country realizing this is terrible. Um, if you've ever seen the uh, the movie uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, Throne of Blood, an early Kurosawa movie, uh, the uh, uh, it's an adaptation of Macbeth, or uh, Don, which is an adaptation of, of King Lear, does a very good job of showing that that, that you know you you can't have rules. It's all unstable, and it's it's a situation in more modern terms like The Godfather. You can never retire and relax. You always have to hold on to people and as soon as you lo loosen that grip the, the people that you were trying to control will turn on you um this doesn't work for anybody it's terrible for everybody and so how do we get rid of this how do we make re uh establish cement between the bricks of, of individual seats of power so we have a wall here instead of a i like to use the analogy of stacking up marbles you know, if you're trying to build an organization of, of with smaller warriors under you by stacking up marbles or ball bearings or anything round like that, that's great. Each marble is, is a separate unit and you can take it out and put it in somebody else's stack. And that's the problem. You can only build so high and then the weight of the stack will break down and, and the marbles are all over your table. So the answer is obviously put cement in between like you do when you build a brick wall or a stone wall. You have to have things to hold this together. So daimyo in the 16th century are all experimenting with things to do this. And, and the, uh, what, the, what Hideyoshi and, and the Tokugawa did was simply take the best ideas and put them all together. And one of the most important parts of that was, was trying to get samurai off the land so they were independent. And also uh, to try to control the size of military organizations in the people under you. 
and have uh, uh, the, the, the Hideyoshi in particular, but especially the Tokugawa's who had very strict rules about the number of castles you could have and the number of, of uh, fighting men that you could have in your organization and, and things like that to, to uh, keep control. So the, uh, the, the sword edicts, uh, Hideyoshi is applying this on a nationwide basis, but you know there are two things that go right together, the, the, the sword edicts and the land surveys, where he's sending people around to actually uh, look physically at the land and find out what, how many fields are really out there. And also, uh, again, not completely original to Hideyoshi, but for the first time applied on a uniform basis everywhere, saying we're going to have one base one standard, which is the equivalent of, of uh, the, what when they ended up cho choosing was the equivalent in rice for productivity of a piece of land. So we can rate a piece of land in one part of the country to a piece of land in another and see these are relatively equal. And that way I can move you around, which is another thing that Daimyo were doing and that Hideyoshi did. And that the first three shoguns at least did a lot of. If you got somebody that's getting too strong, pack him up, move him to some other part of your domain where he's doesn't have any local roots and he's more dependent on you. So all of those things go together. You, you, you do this land survey and, and establish records and you establish a uniform system for how big a piece of land is, what a, a, a Hideyoshi for the first time defines a daimyo as a warrior who controls lands that up to uh, 10,000 koku, which is just a way of measuring rice. Uh, I forget exactly how many square or cubic meters of rice that is, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, but, you know, you, you, he sets that up. And, and at the same time, he's saying also, you know, you want to control the size of daimyo military organizations. So we're going to say, no, there's a military order and nobody else can have weapons, or at least not weapons of war. Uh, it's not true that, of course, nobody in the Tokugawa period had swords except samurai. You could have one sword and, and there were exceptions to the to uh, what people were allowed to carry and such that you can have things for self-defense, but basically weapons were limited to the military class. You pull them off the land, you put them in castle towns where you can keep an eye on them and where they're dependent on you and you disarm the peasants. It's all part of the same system. But again, Daimyo had been experimenting with this in various places in the country all the way through the last part of the 16th century. And uh, Hideyoshi just takes that and says, okay, We'll do it across the country. So again, the short think, uh, is, <laughs> sorry? The short answer to that question is yes, it's both. <laughs> I think that I study that is still useful in this regard, albeit it is it's from the 70s, I guess. Is Japan before Tokugawa, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, by John Whitney Hall and Kozo Yamamura. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I think Nagahara Keiji as well. And there is this article called Samurai in Passage. Yeah. The yeah. Transformation of the 16th Century Kanto by Michael Burt. Mm -hmm. That I think addresses it quite point. and to see the repercussions of that I think that a great book would be Tour of Duty by Constantine Nomiko Vaporis. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you approve those those yeah, yeah. those works but <laughs> yeah no those are both very good things. I I, I strongly recommend them. Great. So here we have a very interesting question and something that I've read you and Professor Conlon and Professor Ferry saying that it existed, but I've never seen it in the documents. But the question is, well, we, we will finally get a, a, a more comprehensive answer. The, the question is, did female samurai exist? If so, <laughs> in which periods were they active in? Otherwise, was there a class of female warriors in Japan? This question is from 
Aline Soto Maior Negromonte. Okay. Well, it depends on what you mean. Um, certainly, you know, during the Tokugawa period, when samurai becomes a hereditary status, there are by definition samurai women, and that's true. During the medieval period, you've got warrior houses, so the women in the female members of the houses, wives and daughters, are samurai in that sense, warrior warrior women. Um, if you're talking about women fighting on battlefields, not so much. Um, you know, you do have during the uh, the Tokugawa period a tradition of training samurai women in, particularly with naginata and other weapons. To they're they're supposed to be the last defense of the the home. Of course, there's no actual fighting going on, so there, there, with very very few exceptions, uh, you know that. They don't actually end up fighting, um, but you know you have whole schools of martial art that develop around training women, particularly in naginata and things. Um, and uh, certainly that probably goes back before the Tokugawa period for the same reason. You know, women are, are training, but women on battlefields, not really. You know, uh, Tom and I disagree on this. Uh, I think, but uh, you know, he thinks that it, that it was probably a f not widespread, but not all that rare phenomenon, at least in the 14th century. And he makes the very good point that uh, there's really no reason that women couldn't fight uh, at least up as, as late as the, the 14th century because the military technology is shooting bows and arrows on horseback. And, uh, you know, uh, men don't have any particular physical advantage over women for that. If you're sitting on a horse shooting a bow and arrow, a woman can certainly, uh, you know, upper body strength and all the other things that, that you might worry about if you're talking about a sword fight really don't play into this. Uh, and that's true. There's no question about that. But it also seems to be pretty clear that there weren't very many of them. You know, there are a handful and two or three very famous stories. And that in and of itself pretty well tells you that uh, um, it has to be very rare. You know, if, if you celebrate one or two women like Tomoe Gozen and, and, and others, uh, there can't have been a lot of examples of that. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, so uh, I'm sure there had to be cases, but you, but, you know, a lot of the evidence that, that you might cite to, to point to, uh, to female warriors is kind of ambiguous. You know, whether when they talk about women warriors, are you really, are you talking about women who actually fought or are you talking about women who were support to fighting troops or are you talking about simply in some cases that it looks like that's just an insult. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, probably two thirds of y'all are too <laughs> young to remember this, but in the, uh, uh, Saturday Night Live in the 70s, the, uh, they had a character that was on, I can't even remember who played him regularly, uh, and he did a sort of Arnold Schwarzenegger imitation, but he was always talking about girly men uh, when he wanted to insult somebody. And, and that's quite likely what the, the Onana Musha meant in at least some of these references. Uh, Tom cites the existence of one suit of armor that's, uh, that, that seems to be designed around women because it has a uh, chest plate, actually has room for breasts, but um, that's kind of doubtful. I mean, it's only one for one thing, and, and it doesn't seem very likely. I'm, uh, Tomi Tonomoto pointed this out when, uh, when we were talking about this at a conference once. And so, Come on, I mean, you know, uh, would you really shape armor around breasts, or is that? What more is likely a uh, uh, somebody's fantasy, you know? The, the armor was made as a joke or for show or for something like that. Just like modern fantasy novels, you know, have all these incredibly sexy armors and things. But there's really no reason to, to contour things that way, even if, it, if if you were making them for specifically for women. So again, I think the basic. Uh, fact that, that you see so few references says, says that it's, it's unlikely. But in any case, you know, warfare does become far more gendered as you get into the, uh, uh, the 16th century and such. And, and, and later, women's status in general tends to fall. 
uh, and they become much more dependent on men. Uh, if you go all the way back to the Heian period, court women, at least economically, were relatively, could be relatively autonomous and had relatively high status. They didn't participate in government and there are all sorts of other areas you can look at, but, uh, but compared to modern ideas, you know, the, where women are supposed to walk several steps behind their men and that sort of thing. That is something that develops over the course of the medieval and, and into the early modern period. Uh, so women's status is falling, women's independence is falling, and, and you begin to really gender battlefields even further so that, you know, there are some interesting, at least one interesting reference that I've come across uh, talking a, a, a set of house rules from the 16th century that, that says that, you know, uh, if a woman sees your back while you're getting ready to depart for battle, then you need to be perform ceremonies and things. Uh, uh, and women are not allowed anywhere near departing troops and, and such, that women are actually bad luck, which is very analogous ultimately to, this, to what happens in the Tokugawa period in, in the, uh, women's roles in, in merchant houses. You know, at the beginning of the period, most of the sake brewers, the, the uh, uh, women, uh, the sake brewery, brewing was largely a woman's industry. By the end of the period, you have the superstition, for lack of a better word for it, that says that if a woman even walks through the, the brewing part of the factory, then it's, you spoil the sake and you have to throw it away uh, and, and such. So again, it, it, it's a, you're creating a, a more paternalistic uh, system, uh, chauvinistic system over the course of, of, of the medieval period. So yeah, I don't think, short answer here is, is, is there are certainly women of samurai status, but women fighting on battle and, and women were certainly training, women of that status were certainly training to, uh, w w doing some weapons training, but women actually participating in battles, it must have happened, but it, uh, but probably just enough to create the legends. Otherwise they wouldn't be legends if it was commonplace. I muted myself again. <laughs> Great, that, that's a very hard topic to, to, to research actually, right? Uh, I mean, I've read an article about Tomoe Gozen, but it didn't lead anywhere. It seems that she was much more probably a, a fictional literary mm -hmm. character character than than a, a real person right yeah. and mm -hmm. well let us see here a question from gabriel rodriguez lanyas professor you have mentioned you have mentioned a few times the problems involved in thinking of other customs other peoples as something that sometimes reflects our prejudices and our criticism and sometimes can correspond to the opposite, something mm -hmm. that we look for in our culture that we miss and want to find in the other. In your opinion, does this movement really exist? Does this movement come much more from the West than from the Japanese own view of the samurai? I think it's both. Um, uh, you know, um, again, it would be interesting to do uh, some kind of systematic look at, at uh, but even, I mean, West, to begin with, is, is, is already a problem, right? You know, that, uh, I mean, our, our are Brazilian ideas identical to uh, uh, American in the sense of people from the U.S. Uh, about uh, warriors and, and such, maybe samurai or whatever, not necessarily, right? And so the throw Japan versus the West is already a problematic construct. But um, but it'd be it'd be interesting to look at what Japanese ideas and fantasies about samurai and compare those to. Uh, 
stuff that you see in, in American cinema or in, in, uh, in Brazilian comic books and, and cinema or, or uh, novels and things like that, or French or German or whatever. And, and for that matter, to compare various kinds of Western ideas. Um, just as a kind of, again, I've not done that sort of thing, but casually, I think there's some, there are overlaps and there are some dramatic differences. There are things that, that you know, Japanese would look at in, in uh, uh, American movie portrayals of samurai or, or uh, uh, you know, TV shows or whatever and go, oh, we all know that didn't happen. That's not right. And there are other things that, that uh, they would say, oh yeah, yeah, that's the way it works. And, and it's, it's uh, most likely true. Um, you know, I had a, a it was very interesting the last six years that I was teaching. I was at Saitama University in Japan and teaching mostly in English and mostly teaching foreign students. Uh, but uh, I had uh, uh, some Japanese students that would take those courses too. Uh, and so it was a very interesting international group that I was teaching to. But I, I uh, one of the times I was teaching my uh, Worlds of the Samurai course, uh, one of the questions I asked on the final exam was to uh, analyze, uh, there's a really good movie came out about the same time in Japan as the uh, uh, Tom Cruise Last Samurai movie. It, it's, the English title is, is Twilight Samurai. Kasukare uh, Tsebe uh, is the Japanese title. Kasukare is... is uh, Twilight. It's, it's a very good pun, actually, because it, it, it takes place at the same time. But it does a much, much, much better job of showing what warriors were really like during that period. And one of the things you see is that by that time, warriors are not warriors. They haven't been fighting men in 300 years, almost 300 years, 250 years. Um, there's some great scenes where uh, friends of the main character get in, into trouble because they don't know, you know, they, they're not officially and nominally warriors, they carry swords and they've had a little bit of training in how to use it. Everybody does in the same way that, that uh, uh, you know, you don't grow up in North America without learning how to throw a baseball, sort of. But how many Americans are great baseball players? You know, uh, sure, every samurai is, certainly knows how to draw a sword and do a basic cut or two, but nine out of 10 probably never do much more than they did much more than that. They don't care. You're not interested in it unless you're really interested in studying martial arts. It's like today you wouldn't. So, um, but anyway, you know. So the movie does a very good job of of, of showing that that, that these that, you know that, that uh, being a, a warrior is not an exalted status. The hero is is this guy who's dirt poor, and barely making a living. In fact, he gets in trouble at one point because he isn't bathing often enough because he can't afford to. Uh, and such. And I asked him, you know, for the final question there, you know, to, to analyze this and, and got one student that was saying, oh, no, no, this didn't happen. It, it, it's, it's completely wrong because, you know, I asked my Japanese friend about it. And he said, no, this isn't, uh, the, 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 um, warriors were not like this at all. And, you know, my reaction is, well, <laughs> if you're going to listen, you ought to have had a clue here that there was a reason I chose to use this movie for the class. And because, and, and, and the fact that I didn't spend a lot of time saying, you know, this is all wrong or lead a discussion to try to get people to talk about how wrong it was should have been a clue as well. And obviously I think that this, there's a lot here you can learn from it. I mean, it isn't a hundred percent perfectly accurate perhaps, but, um, but there's certainly, you know, I, I found it to be a, a relatively realistic portrayal but you've got Japanese that reject that and say, no, you know, somewhere we're not like this. They would never have done this. They would never have done that. Well, you know, this is a movie made by and advised by Japanese experts and, uh, uh, and very carefully put together. So you do have, you know, Japanese misconceptions about warriors and Japanese are just, at least some Japanese are just as uh, stubborn about clinging to fantasy ideas about what warriors are like as, uh, as foreigners are sometimes for the same reason, sometimes for different reasons. This is what my ancestors were like or whatever is different from this is what those really cool guys in Japan were like. Um, 
but uh, again, you know, there's some, uh, there clearly is some overlap and there's clearly some differences. And, uh, so I, I think a systematic comparison would be kind of interesting. Now I've unmuted myself before, before speaking. That, that was a step forward. <laughs> I love Mr. Gattasebe. I found it a great movie. He isn't. He, he even doesn't shave his red his head right, like he's yeah, all yeah. camped and, and all. It, it's a great movie. I strongly recommend it. Rafael like it as well. He just said it on the mm -hmm. chat. Now I have a question that isn't really a question it's a problem with our form so i will ask the person in portuguese and then we go to the last question so marilia andrea você conseguiu acessar a chamada porque aqui tá tudo certo a chamada tá aberta é, eu, eu não tive como ver aqui se teu nome está na chamada. Se você ainda tem algum problema com a chamada, deixa registrado aqui no chat que depois a gente resolve por e-mail daí, tudo bem? So now to the last question, because Professor Friday, Professor Friday deserve to, to rest. We are here. <laughs> For almost three hours, that was extremely generous from you, Professor Friday. And we are very grateful for your participation here. It's a question from Roberto Leão. And he asks, what is the role of martial arts as a means to spread the ideal of Bushido all over the world. Hmm. Um, well, yeah. Uh, again, you know, one of the major sources of, of Bushido myth is the martial arts community, and you know, uh, both in Japan and out, uh, the uh, uh, ideas, pre-war ideas about Bushido and post-war ideas about Bushido, and and. Uh, even more recent reformulations of Bushido all creep into uh, to martial arts study. Some people uh, uh, don't need to connect them. Other people say that you know, martial arts is the essence of, of Bushido. I think we were talking just before the meeting started. Um, I was in a discussion on Facebook a few weeks ago or uh, talking about that. It was a, a discussion a Facebook group that deals with classical martial arts um, and, you know, the connection of this is Bushido, but um, I guess it depends on what you want to call Bushido. I mean, if you're talking about samurai ethics and, and basic stuff of, of that sort, of course, you know, at least traditional martial arts, uh, the Kodyu, uh, they're samurai arts and, and the, the etiquette involved there is, is samurai etiquette and to the extent that you maintain that and you don't maintain all of it, obviously, because you can't. Um, but uh, a good bit of that uh, is, I guess you could call it Bushido. Uh, it's certainly the fact that, that uh, karate people and whatever, uh, you know, so self-consciously pick this stuff up and, and spread it around uh, has a, a big role in spreading the idea of there being a Bushido all over the world. Um, but you know, the reality is that, that if you look at the classical schools, for example, the, the, uh, uh, the emphasis on a lot of the, the, the things that, that the typical martial arts aficionado, you know, martial arts practitioner would say is Bushido, or, or these are martial arts ethics, really have very little to do with martial arts per se, and they're very modern. The, uh, um, you know, strict hierarchies and, and discipline and, and uh, uh, formalism and such that you have in practices. Uh, if you go to a karate practice or a judo practice, judo maybe a little less so because it has such a strong competitive sports component to it that, that sometimes things are a little more relaxed. But uh, uh, 
that doesn't seem to tend to happen, interesting in kendo, which still also has a strong competitive thing to it. But you know, karate schools in particular, but but also uh, kendo and and some aikido schools and things tend to have be very disciplined and very formalized, a lot of bowing and and uh, recognition of the fine hierarchies of rank between students and such, um, and very very strict etiquette. You don't see that very often in if you go to watch a classical school train now certainly when you perform if you're doing a demonstration then you that you start to bring back uh strict etiquette but the reason for that is because you didn't need it in these older arts you know this is they, they were mostly being studied by samurai who already know how to do that um just like uh, uh you know you uh, uh proper etiquette for going to church for modern people. You know, the, uh, uh, if you're bringing, uh, if you're Catholic and you're bringing your Baptist friends to church, you probably spend a lot of time telling them before they go in there what you have to do. You're supposed to do this before you sit in the pew. You're supposed to behave like this. When the priest does this, you know, make sure you do this with us, that sort of thing. Um, and you're, you're going to be watching carefully so that he doesn't commit a, uh, he or she doesn't commit, you know, a, 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 an etiquette mistake that would embarrass him or her. Um, you're not going to do that with your Catholic friends, you know, I mean, a friend from visiting from someplace else in the world. You know, you, you don't have to focus on that. And you don't worry so much about minor mistakes because uh, it's not necessary to. You know what, because you know the, the, the etiquette is ingrained. You know, behavior in a group is, is ingrained. And that's true for samurai. So that, you know, practices tend to be startlingly informal, for example. Lots of joking around and things. It's, it's when you're actually performing a technique that, that everything gets very, very serious because otherwise you get hurt. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, things get very formal. But the other, otherwise, the standing at attention and bowing and things like that doesn't happen in between. You, know, you do something, somebody screws up, and you'll stop. And as soon as you end the sparring or whatever you're doing, you know, you're likely to have both sides crack up. Oh, God, that was, boy, was I stupid. You got me, you know, which uh, you can get in trouble in, in a karate school. I remember getting yelled at when I first, when I was doing karate in Japan 40 years ago. And, and when I first got to Shodan, the black belt, I was running a class the first time the teacher took me aside and said, you're being too polite. <laughs> you can't talk to the younger students that nicely. You have to use coarser language and and and, and be sterner. And, oh, okay. We I was doing classical martial arts at the same time, and and nothing like that went on in in those in those training sessions. So uh, in most of that formalism that you see in in karate and such, and in, in modern martial arts that gets passed around the world, uh, and People say, though, this is Bushido, it's, it's samurai behavior. It's not. It's, it's college club culture and it's military, modern military culture. And it comes from uh, using these arts to, to train, as, train students and using these arts to train the, uh, the pre-war army and such as, as ways to, to instill this, uh, uh, all sorts of different ideas that they wanted to, to, to uh people to take out of martial arts, but the discipline is, is standard barracks military discipline or, or standard college club hierarchies and, and, and behavior and formalism. Not, it's not really anything that's intrinsic to martial arts. So, you know, that stuff gets mixed up. So if, if you're asking about mar the role of martial arts has spread something real, a real bushi around the world, no. Because for one thing, there is no, as, my main point here, there is no real Bushido. There are a million kinds of Bushido. It means something else to everybody who uses the word almost. Um, but if you're talking about martial arts as a, a vehicle for spreading consciousness and the idea that there is something called Bushido, a fascination with Bushido around the world, yeah, I think they play a very big role. Well, thank you. thank you very much again for for your very comprehensive reply, Professor Friday. So a quick announcement in Portuguese. 
Pessoal, é, primeiramente eu quero lembrar que oficialmente o evento encerra hoje e encerraríamos hoje a, os questionários dos vídeos, mas como foi anunciado por e-mail, a gente decidiu prorrogar os questionários até o dia 4 de março, até semana que vem, para que vocês possam ter um tempo a mais de completar o que falta do evento e tal, para ver se conseguem fechar a carga horária mínima para o certificado. Então, fica o aviso, fica o recado, fica a dica também aí. E outra coisa, pessoal, se vocês ainda não são inscritos no canal, nos ajudem aí a, manter produzindo, a, a nos manter produzindo material de qualidade ou, ou tentando trazer, é, trazer realmente um background mais acadêmico do mundo japonês, do mundo histórico do Japão e do Brasil, né? Vocês podem nos ajudar muito seguindo o nosso canal, ativando nos, as notificações, gostando do vídeo aqui para ajudar o algoritmo também. And well, well, then I'll switch back to, to English. Uh, I have a question for you, Professor Friday, if you don't mind. Sure. How is Honolulu Sunshine going recently? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was tempted to turn the laptop around. You can see off my balcony. <laughs> It's very nice here. Yeah. Honolulu is a good place. People, people started to reply here on, on the, the chat box on YouTube. Thanking you for for your very insightful and rich presentation. My and they also thank you very much for your answers to their questions. And we also would like very much to reiterate. Uh, how much grateful we are to to have had this up this incredible opportunity to have you here. Sorry for my English once more. Uh, I'm very unaccustomed to to speak in English. I'm very easy to read, but uh, when it comes to speaking. It's, it's very rusty, so I hope it all ended up smoothly. Thank and you. with that, you know, we we thank you with heartly. We we thank you heartily, and we are extremely grateful for your presence. And. We are going to let you say a few words if you want as, as closing remarks, then we can end the transmission. Okay, well, I don't have a whole lot more to add. <laughs> Again, thank you for the opportunity. It was fun. Uh, I hope uh, I wasn't too incoherent. Uh, again, apologize for having to do this in English, but my Portuguese is even worse than my Spanish, which is only about five words. And, uh, the uh, uh, much worse, <laughs> my Japanese or something. So uh, English is the closest <laughs> language I had to work with here, I guess. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you very much. This was uh, uh, this was fun, and uh, good luck to everybody. I hope maybe. Some of you will go out and do some more reading on Japanese history. It's, it's a big world out there. Please read, read Professor Friday's books because they are really amazing. It will change your conceptions or misconceptions about the samurai completely. And with that, pessoal, muito obrigado pela presença. Encerramos oficialmente o sexto colóquio Nejap de estudos japoneses. As chamadas ficarão abertas, como eu disse, até 4 de março. E 
Aguardamos vocês no próximo evento. Thank you very much, Professor Friday. Okay. I will end the broadcast now. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.